powered by the Perdomo Cigar Studios Black Stage in Indian Trail, North Carolina, and broadcasting from California. Welcome to episode 144 of the Primetime Show. Tonight, we welcome the one and only Ernesto Perez Carrillo from EP Grill for an evening of cigar talk. And as always, the Primetime Show is brought to you by Saga Cigars. De Los Reyes introduces another chapter of the saga, the Saga Celez. Celez is a Spanish word that means leisure after work. In the spirit of the standing idea of owning your own journey and making your own saga, the Saga Celez is the perfect companion to enrich those moments of choice, making them truly yours. Saga Celez carries a blend of Criollo Allure and Peloto Cubano wrapped in a selected Ecuador Shade Claro wrapper that generously delivers with elegance a surprisingly rich and balanced smoke. It's available in three sizes and a portable price. Ask your retailer for Saga Soles. And by Perdomo Cigars, awarded Nicaraguan Cigar of the Year in 2014 by Cigar Journal, the Perdomo 20th Anniversary Blend has consistently earned the highest scores in the industry and is a top seller in humidors around the world. The Perdomo 20th Anniversary Blend requires tobaccos that have been carefully hand-selected and are well-aged for a minimum of eight years. Perdomo 20th Anniversary is offered in three distinct wrappers, a smooth, creamy Ecuadorian Connecticut, a rich, earthy Cuban seed Nicaraguan Sun Grown, and a dark, oily Cuban seed Nicaraguan Maduro. Combining these beautifully bourbon barrel-aged wrappers with thick, high-priming binder and filler tobaccos gives each blend a balanced complexity with layers of rich flavors and smooth, elegant aromas. Perdomo Cigar is a family-owned and operated company headquartered in Miami, Florida with manufacturing and agricultural facilities in Esteli, Nicaragua. Perdomo's highly acclaimed cigar brands include the Perdomo Estate Selection Vintage, the Perdomo Double Aids 12-Year Vintage, Perdomo 20th Anniversary, Perdomo Reserve 10th Anniversary Champagne, Perdomo Abano Bourbon Barrel Aged, Perdomo Lot 23, and many more. For great tasting notes and pairing information, check out the new Perdomo website at www.perdomocigars.com. And by Miami Cigar and Company. Nessa Miranda said it best. There is a mystery and depth to Africa that captivates my spirit, always growing me to come back. This cigar, Don Lino Africa, captures the way going that makes me feel. Cigar making is an art form, but in that moment when the cigar becomes art itself, you have something special. Don Lino Africa returns from Miami Cigar and Company. The blend you remember blended even more massively this time in partnership with Tabacalera. AJ Fernandez. It's an exotic and complex blend meant to mesmerize. Available in five Vox Plus Patolas, Don Lino Africa returns. Ask for it at your local retailer. And finally, by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. Well, welcome, everybody. This is Primetime Episode 144 for this Thursday, June 25th, 2020. This is Will Cooper. I'm on the black stage here in the Perdomo Cigar Studios, and I'm joined Cross country in California by my friend and colleague and co-host, Mr. Aaron Loomis. How you doing tonight, Will? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, I guess we're – baseball's back, so we're going to be uh, – I guess we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. Yeah, I know. <laughs> They're saying it's back, right? <laughs> yeah, but then they keep reporting how many players and uh, people in the front office are getting sick. So, right, right. I don't know how that's going to work out. I, I know. At least, at least they said it's coming back. So, yeah. if we have, um, if we have our, but I don't know. I mean, maybe half the Phillies won't be able to play at this point. So I'm kind of, exactly. I'm, I'm kind of getting a little worried about that. Yep, hundred percent. But at least it's something, right? Um, and hopefully everyone's staying uh, safe and healthy uh, as we have now entered the summer months. And they said this thing was going to die in the summer is what I yeah. heard. So I don't know. It's just getting stronger. It sure is. It sure is. And uh, that's not a good thing, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, um, I think what we should do is introduce our special guest. And we haven't had this gentleman on the Thursday show. Um, but we want to welcome him to the Thursday show, Mr. Ernesto Perez Carrillo of EP Carrillo. Ernesto, welcome to prime time. I, sure you unmute him. I, have to, I, I didn't unmute him. <laughs> you blew it. <laughs> I blew it. I didn't unmute him. I lost my screen. Hang on, Ernesto. I'll get you in. <laughs> That's all right. I think he should be coming back. Uh, it's not let me unmute. Oh, here he goes. All right. There yeah. You go. that, yeah, there you go. There you go. Sorry about that, Ernesto. You see, you see, that's that's where 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 you know, people know how old you and me are. Really, we're not up to the technology. You see? Oh, I, I don't. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. You see, I keep seeing this thing unmute, mute, mute, and and I'm and I'm confused here. You know, what should I do? Unmute it, mute it, or you know, what's the? Uh, and I can tell you know, it's uh, that's a young man's game. <laughs> I'm getting older. You know, as I get into my fifties, and I'm getting less and less like. 
technology with this stuff. I'm telling you. Um, yeah. and, and even my day job, I don't really, I, I'm in a technology company, but I don't do technology, so to speak. So okay. it's kind of like, I struggle a lot more with this stuff than I used to. And then, then I see my boys, they just can do all this stuff for me. I know. I but know. listen, it's, 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 it's a joy. It's a pleasure to, uh, to be here, uh, you know, be here at the show with you. And, um, and I know last time we were there, I was in Dominican. And um, just to show you how, how technology changes. Remember, we were like an hour before trying to figure out the, uh, the connection there. Oh, I yeah. It was guy, remember that? Oh, yeah. We, and we, we, had, we had a trouble with your video that night. And, exactly. Yeah. And so, we I mean, unfortunately that, couldn't go with the video. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So we, we, but, looked, yeah, we looked at Ernesto because with this Zoom, we started using it about nine months before everyone else found out about it. Okay. And it was like the best kept secret for a while um, because it is a lot easier to work with the technology here for our guests. So mm -hmm. that's been good. And, and it's also good that now when we say Zoom, most of our guests are using it in other. Exactly. Yeah. So that's pretty good right now. Good, um, good. But, but, it, but it is really good to have you on the show. I just want to say I'm smoking. I'm going to start the 8x58 of the. Ah! <laughs> I know that's your size. That's my size, man. That's one of my favorite. You know, a lot of people don't know, even when I was, um, when I started making cigars, but back in, in 19, well, I should say back in 1970, we used to have a cigar that at that time was a 52 by 8, was called Soberano. And that thing was, you know, at those days, you know, those were the, you know, the, the, the cigars that were like the, the, like the uh, you know, like the inch of today, I guess you could say, the big ring gauge cigars. And I've always had a, uh, you know, I've always loved those, those you know, uh, big, long cigars. Yeah. Yeah, I remember I actually got these the night you were up in Greensboro. New Jersey, New Jersey. Oh, my God. Yeah. Th so this is batch. from that, this is a four-year-old batch. Um, wow. So, yeah, this is, I have a couple of these left the night we were over, uh, the night before, um, Smoking in the Carolinas. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. remember yeah. That. yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, they, this is, uh, I know this is your size. But we do, like I said, definitely appreciate you coming on. Um, Ernesto, I want to kind of kick this off, like, right out of the gate because mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, does, you know, I'm looking at the cigars that are coming out this year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying to figure out which is the ones I'm most excited about. And I, and I think when this one was announced, mm -hmm. and I'm not just saying because it's on the show because I've, this is the most exciting cigar that I think I'm looking forward to this summer. And that is the pledge right now. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about this cigar for a lot of mm -hmm. reasons. So, um, you know, because so why don't you talk a little about this project? Cause I'm, I want to, I want to hear it from your mouth actually on this. Okay. I think that, you know, to start this, this, um, conversation, I guess you could say, um, you know, I go back a long way with this, uh, Habana, uh, Connecticut Havana uh, rapper. As a matter of fact, back in 1980, when I took over the, the factory, at that time we used to, uh, you know, when we, the cigars that we made here in Miami, the Fumas, the Casadores, the Super Habaneros, we used to make those cigars with broadleaf. And broadleaf at that time was selling for about, I don't want to say 225 a pound. Um, and about a year, two years, I think it was like 1982, 1983, I got introduced to this rapper that at that time was being grown in Massachusetts by uh, a gentleman called Peter Walwaski, I think his last name was. And I mean, when I, when I saw this rapper, I, you know, I fell in love with it because, you know, it has such a chin. It, has, uh, it had a, a, a completely different profile than the, uh, the broadleaf at that time but has some of the, uh, you know, the creaminess also that particular tobacco. So we used that for, you know, for, for a while. Uh, you know, this was something that I could get at times. I couldn't get at times. But I, I was kind of reintroduced or, 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 or came together with this rapper again uh, a few years, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I believe. And we started doing an experiment. I came out with the TAA exclusive. I've done some other things for Crown Heads with this rapper. And finally, you know, it was like um, I was able to to get a a a, a consistent and and uh, large inventory or supply of of this tobacco. Uh, and this is when you know I decided uh, last year 
that this is the the uh, you know the new edition that we could come out with the Perez Carrillo uh, series, for the simple fact that you know every time I, we've come out with something with the Perez Carrillo series, which is you know Laura selected the encore, it has been with rappers that either haven't used in a while or haven't made you know on on a national base uh, line or, or or brand or anything like that. So I'm very excited that I was able to get you know a lot of this tobacco. And the most important is not the fact that, you know, we're going to get it, that we got it last year, that we're going to get it this year. It's going to be a consistent um, tobacco that we'll be able to use, you know, or not only for the pledge, but maybe down the road for some other things. But that's basically, you know, I think the key about this, this, uh, this particular uh, brand. And um, I mean, you know, the rapper, I mean, it, it, I go back with it, you know, so many years. And it's you know it's one that I that I truly love. I mean that one and the uh, and the uh, you know the encore, La Historia. Um, those are kind of you know in reality you know very important projects for me. And of course you know the Sumatra, which has been always my favorite rapper. Uh, so I mean I'm I'm very excited about this this uh, particular line that we're going to be coming out is probably by August. We'll, we should be out with it. And the blend is basically a. Um, a uh, Ecuador binder, and we use um, uh, Nicaraguan fillers. We use it in, uh, you know, tobaccos from uh, Somoto, uh, Esteli, you know, different areas in, in Nicaragua. Um, but I'm excited, let's put it that way. I'm very excited. And I think now with this particular wrapper, we're gonna have like the medium, which is the end code. We're gonna have, you know, your medium plus, which is gonna be the, uh, the historia. And this is gonna be more on the plus side. Okay, so uh, I'm looking forward to um, you know to have my my uh, my fans and and you try it. see what guys what see what you guys think. Yeah, like I said, Ernesto, I've I've kind of really enjoyed that rapper again going back to the TAA cigar and then some of the mm -hmm. Super Crown heads. That's mm -hmm. that's what kind of really got me like fired up about this when I when mm -hmm. I heard and I and I I did you know I knew you were coming out with I saw some things coming out that there was going to be another uh, addition to the family series. And mm -hmm. I, I heard the word Connecticut. And I guess I assume maybe it would just be a shade, right? I, and I should have <laughs> thought, right, that, that it was the Connecticut Habano, uh, which I think, like I said, that is a little bit of your secret sauce that you've had over the years for sure. On well, let, 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 me, let me tell you a funny story about that. Uh, when we started, you know, when we started working on, on the pledge, the pledge was, and I think Lisette has told the story, you know, how we came about with the, with the, uh, with the name. Uh, which is, you know, basically, you know, my, my, my pledge, my commitment, the family commitments, you know, to keep bringing out, you know, the best that we can and be as innovative as, as we possibly can with the tobaccos that we use. But uh, when we started uh, last year, we started looking at this and uh, it's a funny story, man. And I brought in a different, you know, different types of Connecticut uh, shade, Ecuadorian uh, Connecticut shade uh, tobaccos. And we made like, I don't know, I made like six, seven, eight blends. And, you know, we're smoking the cigars and, and because we wanted to come out with something maybe on the milder side, right? To have more of a, a, of a portfolio for those people that, you know, that enjoy a milder cigar. So we started smoking those cigars. And, you know, I can tell me that it, uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, my group in, in Dominican and my group here in, in Miami, and we're smoking the cigar and we're looking at each other like, you know, waiting for something to happen. And I mean, no, they, they were not bad cigars, but you know, we just kept looking at, at each other. And then I remember, this is, this is funny, I remember on my, on, on a previous trip that I made to uh, to Dominican, I had made some samples of the, the one we're gonna come out with. I made like, I don't know, 10 cigars. And I had like maybe like I don't know five or six left. So I, you know, I bring them to the uh, to the uh, to the factory down here, and as soon as everybody lit up, you know, uh, they just looked at me, and they said, "I remember my son Ernie said, you know, this is it, man. You know, we can we can we can't even question this. This is a cigar that we got to put out." So I mean, that was for me. That was like, all right, let's do it, man. You know, but. I mean, frankly, if, if, you know, if I were to tell you that this was something that, that um, I thought of doing, uh, which I did, but maybe not on this series, 
and and this guy just said, no, this is what we're gonna do. You know, so I said, all right, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with my my kids. <laughs> so let's do it. <laughs> right, that that's great. Yeah, that's yeah. great. And it's gonna come out initially in two sizes, right? Uh, robusto, Correct. Yeah. Toro? Robusto, yeah, robusto and a, a Toro size. Okay. That's good. And it's a, it's a completely different blend than the other two. It's not just like you took a wrapper. It's very different, the blend. No, it is, it, it is different. It is different. I mean, you know, just because, you know, people, you know, hear that, you know, it's a Nicaraguan blend or whatever. Um, there's so many different, you know, zones, uh, even though, you know, there's Jalapa, Condega, and Esteli. Just like in Dominican, there's, you know, Jacagua, Navarrete, La Canela. Uh, but within those areas, you know, there's certain farms, there are certain zones, there are certain seeds. And this is really where, you know, where the uh, blending uh, skills come in. You know, how do you get this tobacco from, you know, these different uh, areas of the country and make them into something that's really uh, unique and special? And so this is what we try to do every time that, you know, we come out with a cigar. We, you know, we, we just don't want to repeat the same thing and say, yeah, let's put a different band and this is a different cigar, you know, it's yeah. gotta be different. Cause I mean, that's what I enjoy. That's what I enjoy doing. So that's good. Yeah, that's good to yeah. hear. Um, and, um, like I said, either way, I mean, whatever, how you get to the blend is how you get to the blend as I would say. So if you're happy with the blend, I think that's the most important thing there, right? That's it. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. That's and, awesome. and, and it's, uh, and, and, you know, it's funny because, you know, during this, this, uh, period, which I've been, uh, home a lot, I've been, you know, thinking and going through all the different tobaccos that we use, all the different uh, blends that can be made from, you know, from all the tobaccos that, you know, not only that we use, but that are around. And when you look at it, you know, uh, I mean, there's still a lot, a lot to be done man, with, with, with tobaccos, with blending. So uh, now that doesn't mean that everybody's going to accept it and like it, but believe me, this, I mean, I think, we, we're at the tip of the iceberg when it comes to what can be done with tobacco and how many new blends can come out in the future. So I see a, a lot of, you know, positive things uh, in the future as far as, you know, blends and tobaccos that are just going to make, you know, this, this industry even more exciting than it is now. So. Ernesto, along, along those lines, um, I guess the one, have you ever, you haven't done a lot with Dominican rapper, right? You've done some, but have you done a lot with Dominican rapper as of late? And is that something maybe you'd look at doing? I think that's something that, you know, for next year, um, I, 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 I want to start working because there's, you know, there's very good Dominican rapper out there. Um, the only, you know, the only thing now I think with Dominican rapper is that there's availability but there's not really that much. I mean, except for, you know, Fuentes and, and uh, Lito, I, you know, he's growing some rapper also. But I mean, for, for myself that I, I don't have a farm, but basically buy from, uh, from uh, producers or, or growers, um, it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, but I think, you know, in the next, you know, two to three years, we're gonna be, I think we're gonna be happily surprised with what's, uh, you know, with some of the things that are coming out of, uh, Dominican as far as rapper is concerned. That's good to hear. And, it, and, it, and it's got to happen. It's got to happen because, you know, Ecuador now, there's, you know, there's, uh, there's so many people growing tobacco in Ecuador. Uh, and basically that's where a lot of the rappers is coming from, Nicaragua, you know. But I think uh, Dominican has, you know, some, some really good stuff that, uh, that in the next, like I said, two or three years, we're going to be uh, very pleasantly surprised. That that's great to hear. That's exciting mm -hmm. to hear on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Ernesto, kind of taking a step back for a second, what, something I don't know if we ever asked you before the last time, but we'll ask it again if you haven't. We always like to have our guests talk about um, their first experience smoking a cigar. So what was mm -hmm. your first experience like with that? Well, my first experience was um, my father he bought he bought the the, the factory uh, the little factory he had, that he bought on Cayo back in 1968 and he had one one cigar maker so my first experience at that time I was playing music um, and you know the the cigars that he was making let's put it this way were too strong for me because it was the first time I was going to smoke a cigar so I said you know let me go out 
and get some mild cigars. So I, I went out, I, I think, I think I got some Garcia and Vegas or, you know, one of those machine made cigars at the time or handmade, who knows what they were with a Candela wrapper. <laughs> so I remember I had a, a, a 65 uh, Mustang and I said, you know, I had my, my drums, you know, my, my tuxedo and I got in the car and I, you know, closed all the windows and started driving. I was, the job was in Hollywood, which is about, I don't know, maybe 40 minutes from where I live. So I was smoking my cigar. I get there to a job around, I don't know, nine, 10 o'clock. I set up the drums. And the first set, I started feeling like, you know, dizzy and, you know, what the hell is happening to me? And, you know, I think by the second song or whatever, you know, I just puked out everything that I had. <laughs> so that was my first experience. The good thing was after I, I mean, you know, needless to say, the band leader wasn't too happy with it, you know, but what could I do? Yeah. The good thing was that after I did that, I felt good. I felt better. And yeah. um, that was basically my first. So, you know, the following day, I told my father about that. And uh, he said, well, you know, uh, Candela wrapper, it, it, it's, you, you think it's mild, but really it's, it's that type of wrapper that can, you know, give you that, that uh, you know, that woozy feeling, I guess you could say. He said, you should have started out with what we make here you probably would have been, you know, not as sick. But at that time, he was making, you know, the, uh, the uh, Fumas. We had one guy, Eugenio, Eugenio Gonzalez, who, uh, I mean, the guy worked for us, I don't know, for, till I saw the company. And even after that, you know, he stayed with us. So, and those were, I remember those were short filler. And we will use a, uh, I think it was a Mexican binder and broadleaf wrapper. So, he said, you should have smoked this cigar, not, you know, not toast. <laughs> but listen, I learned, I learned my lesson. Yeah. Now, did you ever, have you ever blended a Candela since then? Like, to, yes. For a brand yes. You have? Yeah, we have, we have. We did, uh, we, at one time we did some La Gloria Candelas way back, Gloria oh. Cubana Candelas. Uh-huh. But I have not done any, any, any of that now. Okay. No. Where are you? And it was a point, so you started, eventually you transitioned, started working at the factory. When did that occur? Well, that occurred uh, really around 1970. Okay, I was still, you know, playing music. Uh, but I was also going to, uh, you know, to, uh, to the factory. We had a small factory. We had, you know, at one point we had maybe, we started with one guy. We had like maybe five, six, seven, eight, ten people. But one of the things that, you know, that, that intrigued me was the, um, you know, the mastery, the, the, the you know, the, the cigar makers that were working at that time, they were all Cubans and they were in their, you know, 70s, 80s, 85 years. And those guys were absolute masters. You know, I always, I always remember there was a couple, Enrique and Onelia Valdez, and they only make like 75 cigars a day. Palma de Mallorca, which is the 38 by, by seven or seven and a half. And those things were like candles, you know. I mean, the 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 time that they put into making those cigars, you know, the the bunching, the wrap. Matter of fact, in those days, those guys didn't use a bunch. They used a little uh, a rubber band, and they would make the bunch, put the rubber band on, and once they had fifty cigars, then they would start rolling, you know, taking off the rubber band, of course. And those were true masters, man. You know, and I and and I see that, and I go back to those days. And I think that's really why, why you know, I, I fell in love with this, with this business because I see, you know, so much that's happened since those times to, to today. And um, and even today, I'm still, you know, I'm still excited about what's uh, what's happening in the industry. Sure, and I could definitely tell for sure just from our intro conversation on that. Mm -hmm. um, there was a point where you decided though to sell uh, your company, and that was. Uh, um, 99. 99, yeah. So it's over 20 years ago. What led into, why at the time did you decide to sell it? Well, you know, I, I think the, the, the fact that at that time, uh, my, my kids weren't really, well, my daughter, she had, she was away at school and she started in, in her uh, law profession uh, during that time. My son was going to school also. And uh, it was just getting, you know, for for me and for my wife, you know, me going back and forth all the time to Dominican and, and keeping the, the, the factory in Miami, 
it just got a li- to be a little bit, you know, too much for us. Also, the fact that, uh, you know, I, I know that if, I knew that if we wanted to at some point, you know, grow the brand uh, and, and become a national world brand or whatever, you know, we needed to have the, uh, the sales, the marketing, the finance, all that type of stuff. And um, believe it or not, at that time, it, it, for us, it was difficult to try to set up a group like that. And, um, and then of course, you know, we had, we had all these great, uh, you know, companies approach us and, and, uh, and, and basically, you know, I think that's probably why I sold because of the fact that, you know, first my kids, they were, they wanted to do their own thing and, uh, it was just getting too hard for us to, to keep the, to, to keep the business growing without having the proper structure. Right. So, and so you, you sold and one thing that I found just kind of seen a lot of times when one company buys another, you know, usually sometimes the owner of the company acquired will stay on for a couple of years. You stayed on for, I want to say eight or nine years after that, which is a long time. So you had a nice run at general cigar. Yes, I did. You know, and and I think the, the reason for that is, you know, uh, I felt, you know, I felt, uh, I felt good. Uh, I I was hoping to, to someday, I guess you could say retire. Uh, the fact that, um, I was able to basically just work on what I wanted to work on and do what I wanted to do, which at the time, unfortunately, wasn't much because La Gloria Cubana, it was just growing like by leaps and bounds after General took it over. I mean, with the sales force, the distribution, the marketing, that brand just exploded. And so I wasn't not really able to do that much more, but it kept me very busy. But, you know, after, after I think it was, what, eight years, you know, I, I, I kind of, the bug got into me. I said, you know, I mean, there's all these tobaccos being grown out there. There's all these new things happening out there. Um, and I just got restless. And I said, you know, this is the time for me to, uh, to move on. And um, I was very supportive of, you know, the family and, and, and the kids also. You know, the kids, uh, one of the uh, things that was so so uh, special about it was that the kids also got involved with me in the business. That so. was, yeah, yeah, that was great. And you started the company, let's say, you released the first car in 2009, the inaugural. 2009, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so when, you, when you left General, when you were starting to form EPC, is that the time where you established the factory, Tobacco Laro La Alianza? Right, that was doing the, the uh, okay, we had like, uh, and you know, we had like a, uh, I had like a two year non-compete and uh, basically they asked me to stay on. And I said, you know, I'm happy to, but I, you know, I have to start working on this. And you know, they were cool about it. So it was basically during that period that I was able to uh, set up the, the company. And I left general, I think it was in April. And we started, we started uh, probably uh, um, two months, three months after that, you know, we were, producing uh, some cigars already wow so yeah wow i mean the factory wasn't completely set up but you know we were we were we were making some cigars at that time and that's the first year we went i think we went to the show in august of the uh, rtda show but my mind served me right and uh you know that was also a, a i mean it, it's it's funny because you know i look back now and it was like a, it was like a, uh, like a movie, you know, all these, all the things that we went through, you know, the family, you know, me, um, you know, down there with, you know, some of the guys that are, that are still with me, you know, some of the guys that, you know, left their jobs to come work with me and, and are still with me. And, uh, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's incredible. It's incredible how, you know, this 10 years have, have passed already. Yeah, I mean, um, did in this factory that you've established, I mean, you've you've now become a preferred factory. I mean, for so many brands in the industry right now, mm-hmm. that um, did I mean? The, so, in addition to producing your own brand, you're producing so many other brands right now. Um, mm-hmm. How does that feel to kind of work that end in addition to your own brands? Well, you know, one of the things that that when when you know, like right now, we're doing things with Crown Heads, uh, you know. Uh, Alec and Bradley, the gate, the gatekeeper. Uh, we've done some other things with other people. We've done some things with, uh, you know, general. And uh, there's a few things out there that, you know, hopefully next year 
uh, we can do. Uh, unfortunately, because of the, the circumstances now, it, uh, a lot of plans that we had kind of had to be put on hold. But it's exciting for me to do these collaborations or do these other brands for other people because it's a challenge, you know? They're challenging me, where in this case, you know, I'm challenging myself also to see what I can come up with that's, you know, different uh, for, you know, for these, uh, you know, people that, that, you know, put their trust and faith in, in what I do. So it's a challenge. And, and believe me, it's exciting for me because, you know, I know I'm going to be working on this, you know, for months or whatever. And we're going to be going back and forth and trying different samples. And they're going to be coming to DR and we're going to be smoking cigars. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fun time. I enjoy that, that aspect of it. That's good. But you spend yeah. a lot more time these days in the Dominican Republic than in Miami. Except that for is correct. COVID, except mm-hmm. for COVID, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's basically, uh, you know, I, I try to spend at least, you know, minimum two to three weeks in, in Dominican every month. Because okay. that's, uh, you know, that's, that's where the action, for me, that's where the action's at. Right. And, and the, the factory has grown over the past 11 years, right? What are you, what's your capacity at right now with this factory? Well, we started, when we started a factory, uh, we started with, uh, I think it was four couples. Uh, at one point, we grew to about uh, 48 couples. Uh, and just before the, the, uh, this, you know, issue we had here, we had about 30, I think it was like 36, 37 couples. Now, because of the, the situation we're going through, uh, we're only allowed to work at 50% capacity. So we're down to, I don't know, maybe 18, 20 couples. And, you know, so they go through that third phase. We're not allowed really to bring in, you know, more people because they want social distancing, you know. And, um, and thank God, I, I'm happy to say, you know, it, it, for us it's worked out. Uh, because nobody has gone sick and you know that's really key and important for us so everybody has you know their you like for instance before we had uh four four um cigar makers to a uh, to a bench now there's only two so needless to say you know we've we've really spread out all the uh as much as we can the uh you know from from each other we try to spread people as much as we can from each other and they wear the mask and they wear the, the shield and, you know, all that type of stuff. Sure. And you, if I, I think I read this somewhere, you actually kept your factory closed a little longer than some of the other folks, if I'm not mistaken, just to play it on the safe side. Is that correct? Well, what happened was, you know, when, and, and remember March 11th, you know, we started <clears throat> hearing about, you know, how bad this thing is. As a matter of fact, that pro cigar. You know, we started hearing about, you know, how bad this thing was in China. And on March 11th, I remember, you know, I, I told my guys, I said, you know, I think we should close um, next week, I remember. And, uh, and they said, no, and listen, let's, let's you know, let's, let's hold on because, you know, this thing is not, you know, it's not that strong down here. And um, the following week, I'm back here in Miami, and I was supposed to go back that Sunday. And they said, no, "That's what we, we have. I think we should close because it is starting to, you know, get really, uh, you know, the the the, uh, the infection rates really starting to get high up here." So we closed on the 19th of March, and we opened. I think it was what the 20 something of May. So we did close a long time. Yeah, and I think that um, you know. Uh, was it necessary? You know, maybe it wasn't because now I understand that cases are still, you know, going on and maybe getting a little bit stronger. But at that time, I felt that was uh, the right thing to do because at that time, everybody was overconfident that nobody was going to get sick, that nobody, nothing was going to happen. And I think now after three months, they see, you know, the reality of what this uh, COVID-19 is and everybody's being real careful to uh, be sure that, you know, that they keep the distance and um, and not get sick. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're talking with Ernesto Perez Creo Jr. Aaron, uh, I didn't mean to anything you needed to ask at this point about the factory. No, I think you're doing good right now. Okay, perfect, perfect. So appreciate it, Ernesto. Um, as far as again, um, going to so you you don't have a timetable in terms of going to full capacity right now, right? It's still just kind of you got to wait and see with that. 
Right. Right now, the uh, the government down there is basically who's who's uh, you know setting the 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 time that you can you know they're going through the different phases. Phase one, I think, right now we're in phase two. So in phase two, basically, you can work, but at fifty percent capacity. So till phase three jumps in, you know, you really can't do anything about it. You right. just have to wait. And whenever that happens, you know, that's when you can start. So, I mean, needless to say, uh, it, it's, it's put some pressure on us because of the fact that, you know, like I said, we had some, some plans to, uh, you know, for instance, the pledge we wanted to come out now in March, April. So now that had to be, um, you know, for August. And plus other, some other things we wanted to come out with. You know, this year is my 50th year in the business. And uh, we will want to come out with a, uh, like a special edition, you know, to celebrate my 50th year. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that, <laughs> we won't be able to do that now. Yeah. So we'll do it next year, hopefully. Yeah, you could just say you're, 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 you're younger, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, just, <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just change the year. Maybe we'll do Bro. my 50th wedding anniversary, which is next year also. So we'll see. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. Good, for you. Good for you. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Good for you. Um, so, yeah. And, um, you know, it, and then last year you had a 10 year anniversary of your company. So that was a big yes. one you hit as well. Yeah. That was, a, you know, that was, a, like, that was very successful. And, um, you know, that's, that's something that, um, um, gentleman that, that, you know, a friend of mine that I love a lot, Salim, uh, and, uh, worked on a lot with, you know, my daughter and with uh, another great gentleman, Starkey. And, you know, I was excited about it, but when I saw what, you know, what they developed, I mean, it was just mind blowing. The box and, you know, the, the cigars that we made and the whole concept, it was just something that uh, um, I'm very proud. It was, it was a great celebration, let's put it that way. And I think you were telling us at the trade show, you signed all those boxes by hand. Or those bands, the bands on all, each the of the bands. Oh my goodness. Well, no, no. <laughs> if I tell you that, <laughs> no, they were what ten thousand? Yeah, ten thousand. Yeah, I don't know. That's modern technology, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> okay. you can you can use technology right. when he needs it. Right, right, that, right. <laughs> that's uh, that's my my what do you call it? My right humor, I guess you could say. Oh, <laughs> I have trouble. I was just saying because I have trouble signing one piece of paper. <laughs> no, this was incredible. No, this. But I signed the first one I signed. I signed, I had to sign like 10 of them because, you know, to get the, uh, the, 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 the signature, or whatever. Right. But no, I don't think I could have done 10,000. Okay. Dollars. Okay. Then I, that, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we asked it. Uh, I just wanted to double check that. Oh, yeah. wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, um, the other thing, just kind of back on the, on the COVID thing with the factory for a second. So you've kind of had a, from Miami, implement a lot of these things in the Dominican. So you obviously have someone on the ground in the Dominican you're working with at the factory and to do these, to do this implementation, right? Well, basically, you know, that whole thing um, was done, you know, by, by the, uh, you know, the, the kids on there, you know, I have, I have a great group of people, you know, uh, you know, Junior Torres has been with me now, like, I don't know, 15 years. Uh, you know, he's been very instrumental in, in doing all the, um, you know, bring up the factory to, I guess you could say to, to, uh, what needs, uh, to be like to, to handle the situation. And then of course, you know, we have, uh, uh, other people there that, um, cause a lot of things that we do have been, you know, homemade. It's not like we go out and buy all these stuff, all these things, a lot of the things have been homemade. And, um, you know, they just kept sending me things. And uh, I mean, it was just incredible. And then of course, you know, here we send a lot of the, uh, you know, the masks, the shields, the, uh, the uh, sanitizers, you know, a lot of things that needed to, uh, that they couldn't get down there, we send them from down here. Yeah. <clears throat> and it, it's uh, funny because, uh, you know, when you see these things that, uh, you know, they were able to build, uh, it's it's just incredible how how the mind you know when when you when you're in a situation like this how your mind or, or or these people's mind I should say you know they just say let's let's do this we got you know they don't even think about what needed to be done they didn't say let's get somebody to do this you know let's do it and they did a tremendous a fabulous job let me tell you that's so really, I'm very that's proud of them I'm very proud of you. That's because I really I have to I have to be frank, you know, I don't have that type of uh 
uh, talents. <laughs> My wife keeps telling me that all the time. Vanessa, you don't even know how to put a nail. I say, you're right. You know, I can't. I don't know. You know, I'm not, oh. that's not my thing. Oh, wait, you, you join my club here. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know how to hammer a nail. That's right. I don't. No, 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 I don't either. <laughs> <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah, that's why I say, look, my kids know how to do that. Man, my wife is probably better with tools than I am. I can tell you. That. Oh, yeah. yeah. I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Right. You know, Ernesto, as far as like your blends go and, and the tobaccos, uh, one thing I've noticed over the years kind of following you is when you, particularly E.P. Carrillo, um, when you started out, a lot of your blends in, in terms of the binders and fillers, you were using a combination of Nicaraguan and, and Dominican. Mm -hmm. And it seems like over the years that they've now gone more towards Nicaraguan. Uh, right. Nicaraguan. Is there any reason for that change or is it just kind of something that, you know, you wanted to kind of go in that direction for? <clears throat> well, you know, I think, you know, th there's, there's a couple of reasons. There's, there's a few reasons for me doing that, you know. When I decided to open down in, in, in Dominican, you know, after I left General, uh, I didn't want to do something that I was doing before. I didn't want to make a, a CVR. I didn't want to make a La Gloria, um, which at that time was also a blend of uh, Dominican and Nicaragua and right. you know, Broadleaf and Sumatra wrap. Because I thought, you know, I, I think it, it wasn't fair. Uh, you know, they bought me out and uh, it wasn't fair to me to, you know, come back and try to compete with them doing what I was doing. And to make a, a Dominican cigar, you know, um, at that time for me, uh, you know, there, there was uh, L LFD, there was Fuentes, you know, there was Generals, Altares, Davidoff. I think there were, you know, great cigars that I don't know if I could have improved on what was being made over there. Maybe I could have, maybe I, I wasn't. So I wanted to get away from that and I wanted to kind of distinguish myself in Dominican with the types of tobaccos that I use. This is why I decided to start using more Nicaraguan tobaccos because, you know, of the fact that uh, it was going to be different than what was already happening down there in Dominican. And um, that was basically, you know, my, my main thing. You know, one, I didn't want to compete with General. And secondly, I wanted to be different than was, you know, being done down there now. And that's has always been my thing. You know, I've always wanted to be or, or try to be different than the, uh, you know, than what other people are doing, or, or at least my blends would be different than what other people are, are doing. Yeah, so. and when, when you introduced the core lines, I mean, first you went with the inaugural, which, which was completely, it was, I remember, completely different than anything you had ever done before. Right. Um, missed that cigar, by the way. Um, it, was a, it was a wonderful cigar. Um, and I may have a couple still like that old, right? <laughs> but you, yeah. you went to the core line and you went, you did go back to your bread and butter, uh, with like, cause I always associated you with Ligori, Sumatra and Broadleaf, but you did go back to it with core line and you did create something very different at the time with those cigars. Yeah. The core line was also a, a, uh, a combination of, uh, we were using a Sumatra wrapper, uh, and the, the binder was, uh, from Esteli. And then we had some, um, you know, Dominican tobacco also, but, you know, on, on, uh, maybe like 20%. And um, that was really something that um, I was, I was, I think the first cigars that I made, that one in particular, I wanted to find my way, you know, because I've, I've, you know, I've been making cigars for, for, you know, that have been successful for so many years, as was La Gloria Cubana. You know, it's hard to just come out and say, okay, what is the next thing? that's going to put me uh, apart from what's happening, you know, with the other company. So it was a time, I think, you know, probably the first two or three years uh, were time of experimental, you know, find my way in the industry because, you know, the original, the inaugural that we came out with, that was you know, going to be a one-time thing. And I think a lot of people uh, misunderstood that cigar because they were expecting me to make another, you know, CVR yeah. or Gloria or Gloria, whatever, or Rico Bano. And this was something that was completely different. It was, you know, a milder. I was looking more, I was, I, I gotta be frank, man. You know, I was looking more to that, you know, Cubanish, you know, milder, creaminess, you know, that sugary type of sweetness. That's what I was looking for in that cigar. But unfortunately, 
you know, people say, well, no, that's not what we want from Ernesto. We want, <laughs> you know, we want a Syria, we want a Gloria Cubana, whatever. And um, that's when I started experimenting in 2010 with the core line, you know, coming out with different, you know, uh, something different than, than the Gloria, but something that had a, a similar, I guess, profile as far as the strength and, and flavors and that type of stuff. And then, you know, we came out with the New Wave Connecticut, the, uh, the Carnal Impact, the Carnal, I should say. We came out with the, uh, the inch, and then the inch just, you know, exploded. <laughs> the inch is still, you know, still probably our third best-selling cigar in, 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 in other lines. That thing just exploded with the, uh, you know, the inch 64 and the uh, 60. I mean, which is, that really gave us a big push. And... You know, once you, you know, you start thinking about it, that's, that's what people knew me for. The, uh, you know, the, uh, the big ring gauge cigar, the CBR. The CBR at that time was, you know, the biggest selling ring gauge cigar, I think, in the world. And, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it still is. Although we sell a lot of inch, I'm sure they, they sell a lot of those inch also. I'm of those uh, CBRs, I'm sorry. And so, you know, so I think that's what people, uh, we're expecting from me, you know, come out with a big ring gauge cigar and come out with something that, um, you know, had a different uh, taste profile than the CBR and different sizes also, which would, you know, I think really that impacted the market uh, strongly. The, the inch was, I mean, when it was 2011 or 12, I think it was around then it came out. That was at the beginning of when we started seeing a lot of these, 60 plus ring gauges come in um and i would no say no no the inch was actually uh 1997 when we started no no i'm sorry the syria yeah the inch was like 2012 You're right. yeah I'm yeah sorry. yeah but the, yeah. but the syria i mean the biggest one i think was the number seven in that if i'm trying to remember i'm trying to remember the biggest the, no the number six which is the 60 60 correct that number right, six right, yeah. the seven was a longer one right right yeah yeah yeah, so, but the inch was kind of coming on when we started seeing some of these companies go to 70, but you, it really took off for you and it, and it sustained it. You know, a lot of these bigger ring gauges, I think some of the fad fell off, but inch seems to have continued. You're saying it's still one of your best selling lines. I hear it I is. Know a lot of people who smoke it too. It is. It is one of our best selling lines. I mean, um, from the beginning, from the beginning, we, we, did have, we did have a period there when a lot of, you know, companies started coming out with, you know, big ring gauge cigars. And we saw, you know, we saw a little uh, slide there. Um, but it just, it just come back. You know, people, I mean, I think that's a very unique um, big ring gauge cigar. And people love it. And we work very hard to be sure that that cigar is always, you know, on spot, consistent, the draw, the, you know, everything. Yep. And um, like I said, right now, you know, after the end court in La Historia, that's our, our biggest selling line. Yep. What's the best selling size of the inch? The best selling size is a 64. So the biggest, the one, the biggest one. Yeah. yeah, that's the biggest, yeah. yeah. Now, if you go to Europe, uh, for instance, and, and France, uh, our best seller there was the 7x70 seven Maduro. Oh, that's right. So See, figure that out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah. And, and also the, uh, the 62 also does very well. But the 64 overall, that's our best seller. Yeah. I, I like the 8x58. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I like love it. that size, man. It's I a great size. It's a great size. I remember you were smoking it. I'm like, and I'm like, that had just come out. Yeah. It's uh which I love was, that size. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's really like I kind of bear who's our other host, we kind of jab back and forth on sizes, and I tend to be the bigger ring gauge guy. And his argument was, um, no, these no one smokes the big ring gauge size and makes it. I said, Ernesto does. And he says, yeah, that's true. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I smoke it. I yeah. smoke it. Let me tell you, when, when um, you know, when I have time, right? And, and you know, after we, finish, after we finish this year, I'll go out and I'll smoke a couple of cigars. But when I have time, I like to smoke, you know, uh, either 64 or, or, or uh, a 70. I mean, I'd be lying to you if I smoked that a lot of times. I smoked, I smoked it once in a while, but that's not really the size that I... Uh, but there's the 64, the 62, those two are, I'm really, uh, you know, hooked on those. Let's say it that way. And for some reason, the 64 Maduro, uh, to me, that's, that's a great, that's a great smoke. That, because, that, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to feel that, 
Well, I'm smoking a big ring gauge cigar. I'm smoking a cigar that I'm enjoying. And forget about the, the ring gauge, forget about the length or whatever. I'm smoking a cigar that I'm enjoying. And that's, I think, what's, what's important. And this cigar, the 64, especially in the Maduro, to me, that's, that's, that's a great smoke. I uh, I agree. I love I love the I love I love all those sizes actually. Um, mm-hmm. so uh, they're they're just enjoyable big ring gauge. So, you know you you've resisted though. Um, making have you made any Lanceros on the EP Carrillo? If so, I haven't seen many. I've made some for for the crown heads, okay. but um, yeah, not for me. You know, unfortunately, I don't know. If, again, you know, going back to the fact that people, you know, they know me for the big ring gauge cigars. Uh, I think that you know we've had some Corona sizes. For instance, we had a Corona in the uh, Scudo. We had a Corona in the um, Reserva. You know, we've had two or three Coronas, and they just don't, don't sell. The, um, we made a Lonsdale in the uh, New Wave, Connecticut. I remember that one. And I love that cigar. And that thing just didn't, uh, didn't move. So uh. we made one for, uh, I don't know if you remember, Rick Galloway. Uh, oh, I know those cigars with the foil. Yeah, yeah. Those now, were those, great cigars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, those those he did very well with. But you know, me uh, us as a company, we really I don't know, I don't know, we, we just can't couldn't get behind them. I mean we, you know, people just didn't uh, I don't know, they didn't enjoy them or I don't know what they felt. <laughs> but we just stopped making those. Especially right. now with the FDA, we we, we kinda of picked four sizes and you know, we, we we're sticking to that for now. Uh, but who knows? Who knows what the future may bring? Yeah, I remember you did the uh, the New Wave Connecticut was one of them, and it had it all. It was a, there was a Connecticut, there was a, a Maduro, and then there was the Silver. So there was mm-hmm. a, uh, and it was that that Connecticut it had the, it, it, they all had the Boulevard style kind of um, right foil on it. The foil, yeah. Yeah, I love those. Uh, but let me tell you, we made I made in back in nineteen was it nineteen ninety. Was in 92, 1992, 93, something like that. We made a, uh, a Lonsdale in the uh, Rico Bano. And um, and uh, I got to tell you, that, that, was, that was an exceptional cigar. At those times, the Cohiba Lanceros were very popular. Yeah. And uh, so I made one, and um, those were really good. But uh, I haven't made any, you know, for our present company uh, – you know, for us, they just don't seem to do that well. No, focus on what does well. <laughs> but we, well, listen, well, no, maybe, maybe you know, maybe <laughs> maybe we'll make one. Maybe we'll make one and see. But it's got to be something like you know, really special to. Uh, uh, we did we did some for the crown heads, and they've had you know the drumstick, the snare drum, mm. uh, and they've had great success with those. Yeah, they they have. So, yeah, yeah. A mule, I think there was a mule kick Lancero too, if I'm not mistaken. They did. They did a, a Maduro one. I don't remember the name now, but they did a Maduro one also that did very well. So. That's great. Now, we were, we were just talking about the inch, and we were talking about the Cabana, Connecticut Habano wrapper. You, you actually brought the two together last year for the Limitada as well. For the Limitada, yes, yes. That was, yeah, I'm, you see, you know, you know your stuff better than I do. <laughs> I, I tend to forget my <laughs> – <laughs> I said the TAA, but I know we did the Limitada also. And, you know, that was also something that um, – Again, you know, getting our foot wet, see how we could, how we could, you know, integrate that particular wrapper into the different, and see what the reaction from the, uh, you know, from the smoker was. And I remember we made uh, what was it, two thousand boxes, twenty, yeah. And uh, I'm happy to say I was looking the other day. I think we have like uh, maybe thirteen hundred cigars left. You know, oh, wow. one hundred thirty boxes, one hundred thirty eight boxes, something like that. Oh, so. Wow. And yeah. I was I was glad to see the limiteds come back. You had taken a few years off from the limiteds, and then last mm-hmm. year was kind of the first year you started going back. What was the reason when you took some time off from doing the annual limiteds you were doing? I think you know. I think um, Coop. The, the the fact is that you know there there's there's. I think you know one of the things that that I'm starting to to realize and to learn, is that. You know you you can be. You can try to be as different as, as, you know, you want. But at the end of the day, you know, you have to, you know, give those people that follow you, that loves your cigars, you have to give them something every year. And, and I would say for, you know, for me for a couple of years, you know, everything that I was doing, I, I just wasn't, you know, I just didn't think that it was that great that, you know, I could keep putting, you know, things out there that for my company, you know, 
that would really excite the 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 uh, the market. And um, but you know, at the end of the day, is is not it's not only that you know you're going to put out things there that you know are are the greatest thing that you ever did, but you know, I want to put th things out there that people are really going to want to enjoy that. They're going to want to, you know, smoke a box and keep a box and not do something just for the fact of, you know, I need to come out with a limitality. You know, I'm, I'm at a point in my life where I don't feel that I, that I need to do that. I need to really, you know, um, like I said, commit to my, my fans, my, my uh, you know, fellow smokers, that whatever I do, it's really going to come from the heart and it's got to be special. Otherwise, man, you know, I just can't see myself. And for a time there, I guess, you know, I get it. You know, it's like when writers, they go into a writer's block and they can't, uh, they can't write a book or they can't paint or whatever. And for a while there, I, I think I went into one of those writer blocks or uh, blending blocks or whatever you want to call it. But um, I'm happy to say that, um, you know, I've, I've been working a lot um, uh, with different, you know, uh, blends. You know, I got, uh, I got guys now in the factory that I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, hopefully start exposing them more as far as the blendings and, you know, the different things that we want to come out with. Uh, because at the end of the day, you know, I want to, I want to be able to, uh, you know, the day comes when I'm not around, you know, I want people to still be able to enjoy some of the things that, that I did. And, uh, you know, hopefully make somebody uh, want to smoke another cigar. So, very good. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. honest. I, I'm I'm glad to hear that. Actually, I I, I yeah, you know, I know that's good. That you know, hey, if it wasn't there, like you have the writer's block. I I I've gone through that myself with writing, so I can tell you. Yeah, I know I know that. So uh, no, and you know how it is. You know, you may do you may be doing great things, and people may tell you, man, this this is a great cigar. This is, and you know, and if you don't feel it, man. If you don't think it's great, because believe me, I've done, I've, I've been in this business long enough that to know that there's a lot of, you know, great cigars out there. There's, a, you know, a lot of great blenders out there. There's a lot of competition uh, and you have to be on your toes. I mean, you just can't come up with something and, you know, be, you know, excuse the word half-ass. It has, it has to be really, it has to say something. It has to have a story and it has to be something that's going to impress people because like I said, there's a lot of, you know, Good cigars out there nowadays. So. Yeah, that's very true. Encore yeah. got you the number one cigar. Um, mm -hmm. What have you learned from having a number one cigar of the year? I mean, what what what? Take me through like what you've learned from that. Obviously, it's a great honor, but <clears throat> well, I think the most important thing that I've learned is that I want to have another number one cigar. <laughs> 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 but I think what is what you know? I think. You know, you got to look at it, you know, the way that I look at this, this, this is a, a, a lifetime uh, thing that goes into that, you know, ever since, ever since the, uh, you know, the, the, um, the rating started, you know, every year, I mean, I won't tell anybody, but every year I was hoping that my cigars would come out, you know, up there. And every year it was, you know, didn't happen. Uh, with a new company, I think we've been in the top 10 for about, I don't know, four or five times, I'm not sure. But anyway, so when it happened, when, you know, in, in, uh, when we got the number one cigar of the year, it was like, now I can, you know, now I don't have to prove myself. Um, I've, I've kind of reached a certain, you know, status in, in the business, a certain, um, that shows that the work that I've put into this, you know, not only myself, but everybody that's involved in this. And now I can, you know, really, uh, not relax, but, you know, fight harder to, you know, try to get a number, another number one. And, and again, it's not because, you know, I mean, needless to say, when you get a number one cigar of the year, you know, people, you know, that's all they talk about. That's what they want. And let me tell you, even this year, it's been incredible how the demand for that majestic is. I mean, if I tell you the back orders that we have on those now, you say, Ernesto, that, that's incredible. But, you know, it also humbles you because, you know, you have to be patient uh, to wait for that number one. And every year, you know, you're almost there and you get knocked down. You know, 2014, we got number two. 
And I was happy as hell because, you know, my, my brother, Hiberto Oliva, he got the number one cigar and I was, you know, with a Melanio. Right. And that was, that, I was very happy for that. And then, you know, when we finally got the number one, I said, man, you know, this, it's, uh, it's, it's just, it's just a very, I guess it's like getting the Academy Awards, you know? Yeah. So, and, you know, and that only happens, you know, now with, with, uh, you know, when you get it for Cigar Aficionado, which definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's a very important, it's very important. But, you know, even, even when, when the, I remember, you know, in your case, you gave us some very high ratings in some of the cigars and, you know, some of the other, and those are important too. Those are important too, because, you know, uh, th th these are a different, different, uh, you know, clientele, I guess you could say different customers. Uh, and for me, it's important to, to, you know, uh, have that, that notoriety, uh, and be known as a guy that, you know, can work in different, with different types of blends or different types of, of, uh, you know, um, customers. I don't know how you would want to call it. And, uh, you know, you're just not tied to one particular type of, of, uh, of, uh, consumer. There's other consumers that enjoy your cigars and that, uh, you know, the younger consumers, the middle age or whatever you want to call it. And I think that's where, you know, the, the blogs and some of the, uh, you know, like yourself and, and, and um, you know, half wheel and some of the other guys, you know, where, I mean, those, 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 I mean, when I don't get a good rating there, believe me, it hurts also. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna lie to you. That hurts also, man. Oh, I, 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 I bet it does. Actually, Encore is one of not. This is kind of unusual because Aaron Bear and I all do like lists at the end of the year. Bear, you know, Bear, he's the other host on the show. Yeah, I, that's like one of the few cigars that actually has appeared on all of our lists is the Encore. And yes. Aaron, I'm, there's, there's, it's rare that we've seen all three. Right. And it's yeah. and Aaron liked that cigar, by the way. He's the yep. pickiest guy of the three. So, <laughs> well, let me tell you something. You know, the 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 encore. I mean, for me, for me personally, right. I enjoy an encore when I'm by myself. I mean, that's a cigar that for me it's it's a very personal um, smoke, and um, I think that. You know, because of the fact that it's all Nicaraguan, it's the first time that I use this, you know, Nicaraguan, uh, this particular seed of Nicaraguan uh, tobacco from Jalapa. Um, it, it was a challenge. I mean, it took us a while to get that cigar. And, you know, not only in making samples, but in learning how to work with a new tobacco that I had never really worked before. So when we got the number one, um, you know, I'd say, you know, the hard work, the, the, the uh, dedication uh, paid off, paid off very well. That's good. That's so. really, that, that's really good. And it, you know, in a way, when you came out with that Nicaraguan Puro, it was like, you, again, it was like Ernesto's coming out with an old Nicaraguan. you had one other old Nicaraguan cigar, I'm thinking. We did have another Nicaraguan cigar. We had the Artesanos in Miami. That, okay. Yeah. Okay. I remember there was another one I thought that you had done. Yeah. Already. But that was, a, that was a different rapper. Right. I mean, it was a Nicaragua head wrapper. It was a, I believe it was a Criollo Corojo wrapper. This wrapper with the, uh, with the, um, that we're using now on the uh, Encore, it's a, uh, it's a different seed. It's a Habano seed that's grown by Ernesto Placencia. He's the only one growing that tobacco now. And um, I don't want to get too much into the details, but it's, it's basically a hybrid of different uh, Habano seeds. Wow. You know, yeah. you mentioned something earlier on, I, I, and I wanted to follow up on it, and I didn't. You mentioned one growing region that you're getting tobacco out of Nicaragua is Somoto, and it's not one. Somoto. We, Somoto. We don't hear a lot about that region. What, tell us about a little about the tobacco out of that region. Okay, Somoto is between Conet, um, not Conet, uh, Condega and Jalapa. Okay. And it's up toward, it's up toward the, uh, you know, more on, on, the, uh, on the mountain side of, uh, of Nicaragua. Now, what I find about that tobacco you know, it has some of the uh, characteristic. I mean, each of those areas has a very distinct characteristic. <clears throat> One thing that that I try to um, that I find for me, you know, to blend tobaccos from those three areas, um, I cannot blend the same. In other words, I cannot blend the same ligeros or the same visos or the same secos from each area. I, you know, I, I tend to use 
like for instance, for Esteline, I like maybe the Secos and the Visos. I'm not a fan of the Ligero. And the uh, Condega, I like the uh, Ligeros and the Seco. And in, in Jalapa, basically, I like you know, more the Ligeros. Mm -hmm. So Somoto is like in between these two areas. And it's, it's, it's a very interesting smoke because it has some of the, uh, the um, it has a lot of characteristics of the Condega tobacco, which is a fuller, fuller smoke, has a little bit more of a bite to it, uh, has a little bit of complexity, but then it has some of the sweetness also of uh, the Jalapa area. And uh, it's, it's a very interesting tobacco. And that, that particular tobacco, I don't think it's that well known um, because it's not, you know, it's not an area that's really one of the areas that uh, are, you know, like Esteli, uh, Condega, and Jalapa. This is kind of out of the way uh, section of the country. So, and I got turned on to that by um, by Hidberto Oliva because they grow out, they used to grow a lot of tobacco there, or they still do, I guess. So interesting, yeah. Is it a yeah. smaller? Is it small? Is it smaller? It's a smaller. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not. Yeah, it's not. It's not as big as Condega or Jalapa or Esteli. No, it's, it's much smaller area. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I've, I had heard of it. I think I've seen it in a couple of maybe blends one or two down along the we, way. We, we, used to, we used, yeah, we used that a while back in one of the uh, mini tas. I can't remember which one it was, but we used it in one of those. Okay. Yeah. 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 I, I had heard. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Uh, Aaron, anything else on lines or blends we want to hit? Then I have a couple more for Ernesto here. No, I think you're just all set. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, Ernesto, I'll kind of ask the question I've been asking a lot of folks. Uh, no trade show this year. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of turmoil with the trade shows. Companies pulling out. Um, give us some general thoughts on the state of the trade show um, and maybe the, what you see for the future, where it needs to go. I think the trade show is, is very important. Um, you know, for the industry. I mean, this is really the only... I guess, you know, trade show there is. I mean, I know there's TPE, there's the uh, TAA, and I don't know if there's going to be, you know, Dorman. But I think, you know, the IPCPR, I mean, I remember starting going to the uh, RTDA back in 1982. And I don't think I've missed one show. I don't think. Maybe I have missed one. I No, I did miss one in Cincinnati. I didn't go to that one. Okay. <clears throat> So for me, it's, it's it different, you know, needless to say, uh, going, seeing how those shows have progressed from 1982, where they used to have one in San Francisco and one in, in New York City. And then we went to Chicago and then we go, you know, Dallas, Texas, uh, Nashville, you know, different area. Um, but I think the shows are very, very, I think this show is very, very important. And, you know, I understand, I understand that nowadays, you know, if you have a show like this, uh, you know, everybody expects, you know, thousands of people to show up. And unfortunately, you know, that, I don't think that has been the case. I don't think it's, uh, and I don't think it's been the case for, you know, a lot of reasons. I think nowadays, you know, there's so much, and I hate to say this because, you know, it, it's, but it's, you know, there's so much deals going on before the show and even after the show that there's really not that many reasons for people to go to the show. And I don't think the, uh, you know, the IPCPR, as much as, as you know, they try to make this show, uh, you know, after a while, you, unfortunately, there's only one place you can have it, which is Vegas. I think that's also not something that, that, uh, that that's helping it either because you know people go there once or twice but you know three four or five times that's a different story but i think you know one of the things that the show has to do is find a way to you know just leave those those you know deals for the show and if you want those deals you know come to the show and get them. and that has not been the case and unfortunately i think that has hurt the, the show a lot but i think you know uh by all means i think it's important that this show you know uh stays because i mean it's the, the the longest running show for tobacco and it's a way great way to to uh you know expose uh, our products every year so i'm hoping next year you know we all get behind it and, and really make this happen very good very good yeah, um, yeah. Um, just like the dormant show you know dormant show i remember when i first started going um what was it four years ago we had maybe i don't know I want to say eight international customers. 
within four years, we've built up, I think right now we have like 42 and, and still growing. So, I mean, they opened the doors for a lot, a lot of people, a lot of people, you know? We're, a lot of like, new yeah, in terms of like outside the U.S., what is some of the bigger countries that you have like a good footprint in right now? Right now, we, uh, Germany is very big for us, uh, Switzerland. Um, let me see what else. Uh, Switzerland, Germany, we do pretty good in England. Dominican Republic is killing it. I mean, it's incredible the amount of cigars that are being smoked in Dominican Republic. Um, we just signed on with the, uh, with the government in China, so we just sent our first order down there. I think that's going to be a huge market for, uh, you know, for the industry going forward. So, I mean, there's, um, and, you know, and, and every day, you know, we're getting calls from, you know, from everywhere, from um, uh, Dubai, you know, we're opening up down there, uh, South America. I mean, there's a lot of people smoking cigars outside of the United States. I mean, the United States is still the, the uh, you know, the kingdom, but uh, there's a lot of countries out there that are really, you know, and suddenly enjoy smoking and, and, you know, not only Cubans, but, you know, all cigars. Excellent. So, That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. Always yeah. good to hear you hearing a lot of people around the world smoking. All over, man. All right. Ernest, I want to ask you our cattle baron steak question of the night. And this is related to steak. Um, and mm -hmm. specifically, I want to know your favorite steakhouse to go to, whether it's in the Dominican, whether it's in Florida or somewhere else. What is your favorite steakhouse to go to? And, and if you don't eat steak, you could say another restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> no, I eat steak. I love steak. Yeah. I love steak. I'd have to say there, there's, there's, and there's a, gr a lot of great steakhouses, okay? I think one that not only I enjoy, but my family loves, uh, used to be Peter Luger. In Brooklyn. Uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Yeah, in mm -hmm. Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, another great steakhouse is uh, Burns in Tampa. Yep. But I have to say, and, and I'm sure you've had tomahawks, you know, tomahawks all over the states. I have to say the tomahawk at Saga's. Oh. The, that's the best you're ever going to eat anyway. And nice. I've, had him at, I've had him at Burns. I've had him in, you know, other places. And, you know, there's nothing compared to that. Now, saying that, saying that, there's a steak. Well, I mean, in the states, I mean, there's, there's you know, great steaks. Needless to say, I mean, but. Those, those two or those three are my favorites. But there's a, a, um, a steakhouse in, in Madrid called um, Asador Donasteri, I think it's called. And that's another, you know, that's another, you know, place that I enjoy eating the steak and incredible, incredible. Awesome. I, now that, that when I get to, finally get to Madrid, now I'm gonna remember that. You know, cause I'll yeah, I'll have this video. I got a few. Yeah, I got a few places down there you're gonna enjoy. That's great. That is yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, why don't we talk about what we're smoking tonight? And I said, do you have time for a short segment after this? We won't keep you long. It's a short segment, fun segment after this. Hey, whatever, man. You know, I'm 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 here. Uh, you know, my whole night is for you. Okay, great. We'll keep you for the next segment at least. Um, so what I want to do is I want to mention what we're smoking, and that mm -hmm. is sponsored by the folks at Tailored Smoke, located in the heart of downtown Charlotte's Epicenter, and now just outside the Charlotte Motor Speedway in Concord, North Carolina, Tailored Smoke is your one-stop shop for tailored smoking experience. Um, so, Aaron, what are you smoking tonight? Uh, I am smoking the uh, Selection Oscuro. Um, this is a very, a very rich cigar, um, very earthy, very woody. Uh, got some creaminess to it. Um, I'd say maybe a little bit of a mild black pepper in there. Uh, smooth retro hail, um, but it's very like it's very full in flavor. But I'd say maybe medium, slightly above medium in strength. Um, definitely would be a nice like after dinner cigar, kind of like a desserty type type of thing. You get maybe get a little bit of cocoa here and there every once in a while. Um, so it's a very nice, very nice dark cigar. I, I enjoy it. What are you smoking, Will? Still got that? I'm, I'm, I'm about eight inch. Yeah, I'm about four and a half <laughs> inches into the uh, eight by fifty-eight uh, inch. <laughs> um, this is a four-year-old cigar that I pulled out of the humidor. Um, so mm -hmm. it's been aging for a while. Uh, it's, it's smoking uh, excellent, uh, fantastic to say the least. Uh, great. I love the sweetness that comes off this cigar, off that Colorado wrapper. It's not too, uh, 
aggressive. The, sometimes sweetness can be aggressive, as like a lot of people say, spice is aggressive. Sometimes it's aggressive when you sweetness. I really like what, what's happening here. Um, you know, I got to say, eight inches, Ernesto, this cigar drew. Like, it's drawing perfect. I mean, so, and one thing that I like about this cigar, and I've smoked a lot of these, and uh, it doesn't run out of gas in the last couple of inches. It, 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 you're still getting all the flavors that you'd want, and you really could take this cigar right to the end here. So, um, it's a good, I really like this. This 58 ring gauge is a great size with it, too. Oh, I love that. I love that that size and that, you know, I love Soberanos. You know, I love uh, big, you know, long cigars. And, uh, and you know, for a long cigar, for me, like a 58 is like the perfect size, you know, 58, 56. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I agree. I agree. It's just yeah. a lot of cigar you can get enjoyment from this on. Mm -hmm. um so and the colorado i think it's the kind of the forgotten blend of the inch sometimes it's really a good blend it is a good blend it is a good blend uh but i think you know people needed to say the maduro and the sumatra um kind of takes the uh, the show you know but that's different that's a different blend and uh, but i think it's very good and um you know we see people here and there you know ask for it uh so we always you know we've always kept you know a, a small production of those very good. I'm glad about that. Mm -hmm. glad, glad about that. And um, so perfect. So that's what we're. Nurse, were you smoking anything tonight? I'm not smoking after I finish. I don't smoke. <laughs> I'm, I'm here in my den, so I'm not smoking in yeah. my den. Okay. Understood. But, I, yeah, but when I, I get when I finish, I go and, and smoke. Like I said, smoke my couple of cigars because otherwise, I, I you know won't be able to sleep. Uh, there you go. You gotta <laughs> gotta well. gotta yeah. do that. Gotta do that. Yeah. So Nurse, so I'm just gonna do a. Uh, like I said, we'll do a short segment after this. I just okay. got a couple sponsor things to do, and then we'll kind of get into it. All right, good. All right. So I want to put me on mute. Uh, you can you can do whatever you want at this one. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, we want to mention Jerry Tobacco. The authentic Corojo leaf is one of the most robust and flavorful leaves out there. During the golden age of cigars in Cuba, it was a leaf of choice to make some of the world's greatest cigars. Because it is one of the most challenging ones to cultivate, it fell out of favor by the 1990s. In the Hamastron Valley of Honduras, Julio Aroa took on the challenge of growing Corojo from the original seeds, and in 2000, he successfully reintroduced authentic Corojo back to the market. With over 50 years of experience in the tobacco business from growing and curing tobacco to cigar production, the JRE Tobacco Farm has been able to continue to deliver products to market with authentic Corojo. Now with Jerry Tobacco, Julio and his son Justo bring their very own brand to market, each containing the authentic Corojo leaf. Tadascano offers a mild to medium cigar in both Connecticut and Habano wrapper. Rancho Luna is a premium medium cigar that is available in a, a Habano or Maduro blend. And Aladino is available in a 100% authentic Corojo Puro, San Andreas Maduro, Ecuadorian Connecticut, or Cameroon wrapper, representing the golden age of cigars from 1947 to 1961. Now available at your local retail, be sure to ask for Jerry Tobacco, a legacy that is tasted in every drawer. And by Toscano cigars, as rustic and strong as the people who smoke them, try Toscano's rustic and full-body flavors and aromas. Made in Italy with 100% dark fire-cured tobacco from the United States and Italy, it is one of the best-selling cigars in the world. Toscano cigars are the perfect combination of American and Italian craftsmanship. Whether in the traditional long format or the short format Toscanello, Toscano cigars are dry-cured, handmade, and fire-cured for your enjoyment anytime, anywhere. Visit your local premium cigar retailer today and look for Toscano cigars today. And by A.J. Fernandez Cigars. A.J. Fernandez's New World brand is named in honor of the discovery of tobacco by Christopher Columbus's expedition in 1492. Fernandez collaborated with his father, Ishmael, on the cigar, which is comprised of a wrapper from Nicaragua that covers binder from the Jalapa Valley and a filler blend of Ometeque, Condega, and Esteli tobaccos. The core line debuted in 2014 and was followed by New World Connecticut, New World Puro Especial, and New World Cameroon. All four blends captivate the palate of any cigar smoker. If you're beginning to discover the world of premium handmade cigars, the New World Connecticut is for you. If you're into full-bodied blends, Puro Specials for you. If you're into complex flavors, the New World Cameroon's for you. And if you're into the robust and earthy flavors with notes of espresso, the New World Escuro is definitely for you. Visit AJFCigars.com to learn more. And by M. Bombay Cigars. M. Bombay Cigars represent the most admired cigar culture of Cuba. They select the best and the best quality tobacco to use in the aging process. M. Bombay Cigars are enrolled in Costa Rica by some of the world's most experienced cigar rolls, giving it a unique smoking experience. The band portrays the detailed and artistic nature of our small industry. Try M. Bombay, Gaia, M. Cuba, and the new MS Philly line. M. Bombay Cigars, where the cigar is a way of life. And we're going to get into our Alec Bradley segment, and sponsor, uh, Live True segment, sponsored by Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley, Alec Bradley. Visit alecbradley.com to find out more about their cigars. Live true. So, Ernesto, in this segment, we're going to take a little break from the cigar talk here. 
uh, mm -hmm. and talk about things maybe that we, you know, they're just not related to cigars, things you may talk about in a cigar shop. And I have some questions here that are not cigar related for you. And there's nothing that's mm -hmm. going to get you into trouble here. So they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're easy questions here. So there's, there's nothing to worry about here. Um, we've used some of these with other guests and I put a couple in here maybe for you. Okay. Um, there's eight questions here I have for you. Um, so here's the first question I have. So you're a drummer, you know, we know about yeah. your musical roots, right? So let's say you're forming a band again. All right, uh -huh. you're going to be the drummer. Right. Who would you want as your lead singer for that band? A professional, not a, not a cigar maker, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, say if you really want to say cigar maker, you can, but a professional no, no, is what I, I was looking for that. I don't think so. Let me see. Who would I want to use that? Who would I want to be my lead singer if I was to have a band? That's yeah. a good question. That's a very good question. Um, There's no wrong answers here either. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's none. You know, one guy that, that I was really, really, I mean, that uh, I'm, I'm really love his voice is, uh, and, you know, he wasn't necessarily a jazz singer, but I think he was a great singer, was uh, uh, Teddy uh, Pendergrass. Oh. Yeah, I like that, you know, I like that. And then there's another guy, I can't remember his, what's his name? But I mean, I like that kind of voice, you know, it's, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the different uh, yeah. ranges that this guy yeah. used to go. I mean, you know, he's incredible, incredible. Ernesto, I got, I've said this on the show, but you don't notice. Uh, my grandfather used to drive Tendi Pendergrass. Really? My grandfather and dad had a limousine company. They had a contract wow. with CBS Records and my grandfather drove Teddy quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's a, so I'm, I've always been a fan of his. Yeah, he's he's um, a great, talent. Yeah, what a talent, man! So yeah. Unfortunate what happened to him, and, and even even like that, he's still you know. Yeah. Great, you know. Yeah. No, it is. He made that comeback at the Live Aid concert. I remember Ugh. that. It was a big deal for us. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Uh, but Incredible. yeah, he got in a car accident right before my grandfather died too. So it was like uh, that year it was all happened the same year. So oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, speaking of cars. Mm -hmm. What's your dream car to drive that you've never driven? My dream car to drive, um, I've always liked a uh, Lamborghini Murcielago. Murcielago, mm -hmm. I think it's called. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think that's, I think I would love to drive that car. You know, I've always, um, I've, I've, you know, always look at it and, and, um, and uh, I think that'd be a car that I like to drive. Not necessarily own, but, you know, drive, you know, and just spend a day driving that car around or whatever, you know, going on the highway and, and see what it does. But that, that's a work of art, you know? Oh, I, that's I, a work I, of art. I, I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm with you on that one. You know, you can go to Vegas and you can rent them. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't, yeah, there's I, in Vegas that will rent them to you. Yeah, I have never done I, it. I, yeah, because I know they, they, they rent them down here, but you see the other version, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the more, um, I don't know, the hip version or whatever you want to call it. I want to, I wanted, you know, be able to drive one. I remember I, I saw one one time, it was black with the, uh, with the yellow, you know, the wheels where it had those yellow things inside. Where <laughs> I, I was, you know, I fell in love with that car. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yeah. 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 Okay, so along those lines, what kind of car do you drive now? Or one of the cars that you drive now? Well, right now I have a uh, a uh, a Cadillac uh, Escalade. Oh, yeah. That's what I drive down here. Yeah, yeah. Love that car. And in DR, I have a, uh, a Tahoe. I think it's 2011, 2012, or something like that. Right. Nice. Yeah, I'm not really that much of a, a, a of a car person. You know, I just like a car that that's comfortable, and that um, that uh, you know I feel safe and, and can enjoy driving. Beautiful. That's that's. Yeah. The most, I agree. It's the most important thing. So, As a matter of fact, the most, let me tell you, let me tell you, so I had, that, yeah, go ahead. I had an Aston Martin one time, Okay. Uh, just oh. when James Bond came out with this, you know, Aston Martin. And I remember um, my wife and I, we went to this, uh, you know, movie theater down in South Beach. And when we come out, we come out of the parking lot and it was like five or six people taking pictures of the car. <laughs> and because, you know, he had just come out with that car and, you know, one of his movies, I don't remember what it was. And so that was pretty cool. I said, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe I, you know, I felt like James Bond there for a little bit. Oh, that's awesome. That was a nice car. Yeah, yeah nice. I bet. I bet. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, you've traveled a lot. Mm -hmm. Is there one country in the world that you still want to visit? 
I think the, uh, you know, I think probably my, my, I think, you know, Spain and, and, um, and France are probably two of my favorite, you know, countries in, in the world, Spain, especially, uh, especially the, uh, you know, not necessarily, I mean, I love Madrid, you know, Barcelona, but I mean, the countryside, I, I love seeing, you know, all those old castles that have been there since the 1400s, you know, Italy also is a beautiful, you know, uh, place to travel through. Um, and, uh, but, you know, basically I think I, I, I would have to say, you know, Spain's really my, my favorite, you know, I try to go back there when, whenever I can. That's so. great. That's great. I haven't been to Spain, by the way. Now, is there one country you haven't been to that you want to visit? Well, there's there's China, which you know uh, I'm 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 hoping uh, you know maybe next year to uh, be able to go down there, and um, Austria here is beautiful. Um, what's the other Russia? I'd love to you know visit also. Uh, so I think those you know those those are probably the the, the places I like to uh, visit. Uh, hopefully, in the near future. Good for you. I hope you get the chance to do that. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. So. Now, I don't know if you like outdoor activities or not, but is there anything you like doing outdoorsy that maybe uh, people don't know about that you like to do? I, I what I what I love to what I love to do is is uh, you know trail hiking. Uh, unfortunately, here in Florida, we don't have too much of that. But I love you know just going out and um, you know getting out of my car. And, and uh, especially in, in Dominican, I don't know if uh, you've been to Puerto Plata where they have the uh, the cumbre, I have which is that the cumbre, which when when you when you go from Puerto Plata to Santiago, there's a mountain. It's called the cumbre, and I love to to you know, it's so beautiful. I mean, people should uh, if you ever go down to Santiago. Uh, you know, you should come into Puerto Plata and just drive through that, you know, just come to that mountain. You save about half an hour, but it's such a beautiful scenery. It's incredible. And that's the type of thing, you know, that I like to, you know, just go out there and, and you know, be with nature and, and walk and, you know, not necessarily go up a mountain or a tree or anything like that, but just, you know, relax and, 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 and see the, the beauty uh, of nature, which is a beautiful, beautiful area, let me tell you. Yeah, that's, I kind of so like I love that. I, I like doing that too, and and if I can smoke a cigar there, it's even better. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I I won't do the hike. I'll go to where I'll take the car to wherever, and then I'll just get out. And smoke. <laughs> smoke a cigar. <laughs> as long as I'm allowed to do it, yeah. And let me tell you something. They used to be not 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 anymore so much because you know that 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 road's been under construction. It's lost a lot of the uh, traffic. But they used to make some of the best uh, chicharrones. You know what that is, right? Oh yeah. Pork rim. Yep. And the uh, and the and the and the pork also, and you go by the um, you know you, you go there by the uh, the different little towns and you see people, you know, um, cooking the pork or or you know and, and the chicharrones and it's it's beautiful man beautiful beautiful. So. All right, your favorite holiday of the year. My favorite holiday, I would have to say, is. Um, I would have to say it's Christmas. Yep. Popular yeah. answer. Yep. Yeah. That's my favorite holiday. Good for you. Yeah. Yep. I think that's the most popular answer on the board there. So, yeah. Uh, I like it now more that my kids are older and we don't have to, like, put toys together anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more well, fun. I, <laughs> I like it because, you know, now, now it's, you know, it's like now, now my grandkids. You know, we have four grandkids. Yeah. And now, you know, the, the toys is for them. So, I mean, that's, uh, it's, it's exciting to see how happy they get, you know, when they get the toys. And that's stuff. true. Yeah. That part is yeah. true. That yeah. part is true. And then the parents get to put the toys together. So. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Ernesto, I don't know if you're into sports, but is there a favorite sport that you have to watch, spectator sport, whether it's live or in on TV? I like uh, soccer. All I like right. the uh, yeah, I like soccer. I like the Premier League. I like the uh, the Liga from from Spain. Um, and and the reason I like that game is because you know if if you look at those guys, those guys are are um, you know like they're like fine machines. You know, the training they have to go through. I mean, to run. You know, be running basically for 90 minutes straight. I mean, that takes a lot of stamina. It takes a lot of, uh, and 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 you know, once you start to understand it and see the different plays that they do, 
it's uh, it's a very exciting game. Um, I, I have to say, unfortunately, I like it more than than um, than some of the uh, you know the sports that we have here. You know, mm-hmm. I think I think to a certain degree. I mean, for me, I'm an old timer, and and I'm, I'm I'm sorry. You know, I think yeah, you know, basketball after Michael Jordan left, you know, I, I, to me, it wasn't the same. You know. Yeah. Yeah, so I didn't see, you know, I couldn't see Larry Bird or, or Mike Johnson. It, you know, it wasn't the same for me. And oh. uh, and baseball also. I think baseball, you know, and I think a lot of it has to do, uh, you know, when you get all these, you know, big names and, and it's all about the money. I mean, don't get me wrong. In soccer, there's a lot of money. You know, those people make a lot of money. They make more money than anybody. But yet it's, they have to be, at their best all the time to stay up there because, you know, you don't, you're not playing right one day and they'll sit you down and you may not play again in the next, you know, three or four games. So, I mean, you always have to stay on top of the game. And, and I enjoy that sport. I like watching that sport. Yeah, I've always I, – I mean, I like a lot of sports. Uh, I've always liked soccer. I grew up in New York. Soccer was very popular in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, it was yeah. popular as you – know, we had the Cosmos. That's that right. Popular. Yeah, right, were, the Cosmos. Yeah. I mean, so Pele came up there to play. It was a big deal. Um, That's right. That's right. Yeah, so so I always appreciate it. Then when – I really didn't get exposure to the, the leagues you talked about until cable TV came. Because we right. never – the only time we'd maybe see those is it was a, a, a – <laughs> a friendly match that came over with one of those teams. But when you saw the, the quality of the English Premier League, the Spanish League, the Italian League, oh, and the German incredible. League, what a, what a difference. Yeah. So, so I look. What a difference. Yeah. I mean, I don't think I watched the World Cup game until like 1982 was like the first one I watched when Italy yeah. won. So, yeah. I've always liked soccer. That, 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 that's the type of thing where, you know, and, and that's what I like. You know, I think whether it's soccer, business or whatever, you know, you always have to be – finding ways to, to, to better yourself and, and, you know, to try to stay on top or be the best at, at your game, whatever it is, you know, whether it's business, soccer, or whatever it is that you're doing. Oh, totally agree. And, yeah, totally yeah. Totally agree. Totally agree. Mm-hmm. And the last question I have for you, what's your favorite movie of all time? Man, you're asking hard questions. <laughs> well, you can pick one. You can pick one. <laughs> let me think about Let me think about that one one second. What's my favorite movie? Oh, I, I no, I, I, you know, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. My favorite movie's got to be, uh, uh, The Godfather. One. Okay, uh, okay, I, I was mm-hmm. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. I mean, Marlon Brando. Come on, mm-hmm. that guy. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, there's no, I, I, there's no two like that guy. <laughs> there's no two. <clears throat> and I also loved, you know, I also loved uh, De Niro. Uh, was it De Niro? Yeah, De Niro. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on that movie, on on you know the the part two or whatever. Yeah. Because he was so cool and so, you know, I said to myself, you know, I wish I was with this guy where, you know, nothing, he doesn't give a crap about anything. But, you know, he's always, the back, you know, he's, it's like a machine that's always moving. You just don't see it move. And Brando, is, you know, I mean, that, I think that was a classic what he did with that, uh, that character. They, Don Don Corleone. Oh Don yeah, <laughs> oh, it was it was a masterpiece. Like uh, that type of just like you had two movies going on in that movie, that Godfather yes. too, which I loved. And you know it's funny because I remember where I saw that movie. Uh, I, I went with my 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 dad, my mom, and and my my wife Elena, and we went to see it at a movie theater that used to be in North Miami on 163rd Street. And that was a long. I think I was like a three hour movie. It's mm-hmm. a long. Oh yeah, it's a long movie. It's a long movie. And I mean, I I never forgot that, you know, that, uh, and I guess that's why I liked it that much because, you know, we, we went out as a family to, to watch it, but also the acting was incredible. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ernesto, I want to thank you very much for being a part of the show here tonight. Um, it was great having you back. Always great talking to you. Um, thank you so much for your for your time tonight. Uh, well, thank you. It's always a pleasure. You know, we've always, uh, I've always said, uh, admire you because you know, you're, you know, you're one of the the, uh, you know, the 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 people that know uh, their cigars. You're very respectful of, you know, everybody that makes cigars, which I think is very important. And, uh, you know, you're just a likable guy, you know, like me. We're both likable guys. <laughs> you're more like <laughs> <And Aaron. laughs> That's right. <laughs> so, hey, listen, anytime, anytime, you know, that uh, 
you know, please feel feel free to call me, and I'd be happy to uh, you know do this with you because I'm I'm really enjoying it. No, we so really thank nice. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. you. Guys. We, thank we you appreciate it, Ernest. So uh, best of luck to you. Hopefully, I'll see you this year, and hopefully, I'll see a pro cigar. Hopefully, that happens too. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's it's um it's um you know very sad what's happening, but we can't lose faith. I think you know we're gonna get through this, and I think you know all of us in the uh, in the industry. Uh, we're doing a, 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 a great job, a great job. And, you know, just keeping this industry alive because, you know, now uh, it's hard times, but like I said, I think we'll get through them and uh, we'll come out really strong. So I'm very enthusiastic. I'm very optimistic and enthusiastic about, you know, this, what's left of the year in, in, two, in 2021. So nice. that's great. That's and just great. keep doing what you guys do. You know, we need to have this, you know, you know, People love this stuff. We yeah. appreciate it. Yep, we appreciate it. Ernesto, so, uh, like I said, thank, thank you. you so much. And we'll be talking to you down the road. Thank you. Thank you again. Right. And uh, Thank you, Ernesto. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Aaron. Take care. Take care. That's thank Ernesto you. Perez Bye-bye. Creo Jr. of um, EP Carrillo Cigars. And what we're going to do is we are going to take a sponsor break. And then um, we're going to discuss a little about my comments about the Trump Jr. thing. <laughs> so uh anyway let me let me mention of course uh our sponsor dumbarton tobacco and trust with dumbarton tobacco and trust master blender steve Saka set out to create corrosion compromiso cigars without compromise this represents an expression of Saka's closely held values and it tests in three simple words everything Saka wants to accomplish cigars are more than a passion of soccer they are a way of life as for the brands of Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust, Sober Mesa, Mi Carita, Umbagag, Muestra de Saca, Total Solstillas, and Sin Compromiso at your local tobacconist. And by La Aurora Cigars, in the heart of Santiago, Dominican Republic, on the rolling floor at the La Aurora Cigar Factory is a section reserved only for the elite, the best of the best. These elite cigar rollers work for over 10 years to simply get the opportunity to make a historic cigar. Those cigars are the La Aurora Preferidos, featuring six different wrappers and a beautifully packaged Perfecto shape. La Aurora Preferidos has been their preferred cigar of the Leon family for 115 years. Take part in a legendary tradition that started the Dominican cigar industry. Look to the lion, La Aurora Cigars. We are Dominican defined. And by J.C. Newman Cigar Company. Founded in 1895 by Julius Caesar Newman, J.C. Newman Cigar Company is the oldest family-owned premium cigar maker in America. For four generations and 125 years, J.C. Newman has been handcrafting many of the world's finest cigars. J.C. Newman is headquartered in a 109-year-old cigar factory in the Ybor City National Historic Landmark District in Tampa, Florida. At this factory known as El Rahol, J.C. Newman rolls premium cigars by hand and hand-operated antique machines. The J.C. Newman Pensa factory is the second largest in Nicaragua and is a brick house, Pearl de Mar, El Baton, and Quorum Cigars are hand-rolled. J.C. Newman's Diamond Crown, Maximus, Julius Caesar, and Black Diamond Cigars are handmade by Tobacco Lair A. Fuente in the Dominican Republic. With its longtime partners, the Arturo Fuente family, the Newmans founded the Cigar Family Charitable Foundation, which supports low-income families in the Dominican Republic with education, health care, vocational training, and clean water. Visit jcnewman.com to learn more. And by Casa Cuevas Cigars. The Cuevas family has four generations of experience in cigar making. For many years, they have manufactured cigars for many industry leaders out of the Las Lavas factory in the Dominican Republic. Now, the Cuevas family brings their very own brand to market with Casa Cuevas cigars. Try the Casa Cuevas Connecticut, Abano, and Maduro, as well as the Cuevas Reserva line. If they don't carry it, be sure to ask your local retailer for Casa Cuevas cigars. Casa Cuevas cigars, from Al Casa to yours. And by Cigar Marketplace. Cigar Marketplace is the first B2B premium cigar and accessories online broker that connects premium cigar suppliers to retailers, simplifying the way our cigar industry does business. Retailers can now directly order from the suppliers they want without the wait getting the customers the brands they demand. Wholesalers no longer need to depend on going store to store to find a retailer that fits their brand. This allows retailers to enjoy a one-stop shopping experience for all their store needs. With an optional monthly subscription of $39.99, the membership, this allows members to benefit from all order free shipping with no minimum, 40% off second day air rates, a 2.5% cash back every six months, a refer a friend program, set discount of 10% off naked bundles and exclusive weekly deals. Non-members can take advantage of, of Scar Marketplace's exclusive deals plus free shipping on orders over $750. Visit www.cigarmarketplace.co to learn more. Well, welcome back to the Primetime Show. This is episode 144. Aaron, uh, any thoughts on the Ernesto interview? Yeah, I think it's great. Um, you know, he's, he's a very interesting guy. He's got a, a lot of history. Um, and uh, he's a very friendly guy. So it's very easy to talk to him about things and he's very open about discussing things. So I enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, that I did too. Um, I, I, like I said, I, that's the first time you kind of really, I guess had a chance to talk to Ernesto, at least mm-hmm. on this show. 
Um, so I know we bear, we did the interview with him last two years ago. And then we talked to him at the trade show last year. Um, there's always something we can find to talk to him about, you know, um, uh, and he loves talking tobacco, which I think is, which is, uh, always fun to do. Yep. Um, we can get into some really good stuff with him on that. So I'm, I don't know. I'm looking forward to the pledge to me. That was like, that's yeah. kind of been my cigar. I've checked the box for at least this year. Maybe something else comes along in the next few weeks. That's going to change my mind, but. Uh, at least for now, that that's the one I was looking forward to. Uh, it was funny because that TAA cigar he smoked, which uses the wrapper. The first couple of times I had it, I was not sure about it, but it kind of came around to me on that. So um, by the time I uh, really started smoking them, so I went through a, uh, a lot of those. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll see how the pledge does. Nice. Yep. All right. Um, let's talk about this Trump Jr. thing because I have a few comments I want to make on this thing tonight. Okay. Um, and um, – we can't, like Aaron, we, I know we can't talk about, I guess, details. You were in the meeting. We can't talk about details in this, right? But I kind of want to just kind of address kind of what I said. And I think there's been some misunderstanding to what I said. Mm -hmm. But I'm, at the same time, I'm not going to back off of what I said either. Um, so the, the, the long story short of this is there was a meeting um, – there was a meeting that was organized by folks in the cigar industry. And Aaron, correct me on if I'm saying this wrong, because I've been trying to word this correctly. <laughs> it was with the Trump campaign. Was, is that, yes. It, it, and that's a key word. Takes. And as a part of that meeting, Donald Trump Jr., the, the son of the president, was invited into that meeting. Yep. Um, so... And I know you and I, we, we went back and forth on really what the objective was w with this meeting, right? I kind of originally felt the way this meeting was positioned, it, and, I, and you, you kind of corrected me on this, and I'm, I'm okay with that. But I think to a lot of people, they felt this was more of another cigar town hall that they mm -hmm. were going to be a part of. I get it wasn't quite that. And there's things about a campaign meeting I learned afterwards that are different than having maybe a meeting like with Rudy Giuliani. Um, but would you say that's an accurate assessment of that? Yes, I would say that's accurate. Okay. Okay. Um, so I want to, my goal of that meeting, and I want to be really clear of when I went into that meeting was I was going in to observe and assess how good, how, how good a connection we had with Trump Jr. and the Trump campaign. That was my goal as a media person there, right? That probably wasn't the goal that anyone in the Trump campaign would want, right? And I think that's a fair assessment. I'm probably even thinking people in the cigar industry wouldn't have want that. The goal I think that they were trying to portray was to have a kind of a candid discussion in that meeting with the campaign, in particular Trump Jr. And it wasn't necessarily a meeting they wanted for public, public display. Right. Okay. So the meeting wasn't like, I was wondering why the meeting wasn't being streamed or anything like that. I, I learned after I made some comments, why it was the case. Right. So at the start of the meeting, I'm on the meeting, I'm on the, I'm, and immediately like within the first minute they announce um, that they want um, all, they basically said to cigar, uh, not cigar, to media. Uh, if you're in the media, we, we kind of want you to leave. Um, I kind of took that a very different way than I think a lot of other people in cigar media took it. And I said, I wasn't comfortable staying in this meeting um, when they really didn't want media there. And I opted to leave the meeting. Mm -hmm. I want to say I was disappointed that they said that, but I don't think anywhere in my comments that I express anger to anyone in the industry or the Trump campaign or anything like that. So I want to make that very clear. But I was disappointed, and I wanted people to know that I was disappointed. That was the notion of my comments there. Okay. Fair point. Okay. So, and I could, and I, and I could say that if I, and I'll talk about it, if I had to make the decision over again, I would still make the same decision. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of calls and stuff on that thing, right? Which uh, is okay. And, and no one yelled at me saying, "Why did you say that?" Um, there were comments I got at least from three key people involved with this meeting. That were like one, they weren't directed at cigar media. Two is you could have stayed as a uh, as a fan, you know, just kind of as a cigar enthusiast and kind of went along with that. Mm -hmm. And three that this some things were explained to me how this meeting 
because it was campaign, there's a lot of things that you have to be very careful that you say for legal reasons, because there's a lot of rules of how campaigns run in this country. Mm -hmm. So I, I understood that. Um, that being said, I couldn't draw a line between me being a cigar media person and a, and a regular media person. Because again, what my goal in that meeting would have been is to assess and observe how real a connection we have with, with the Trump campaign here. And is this something, is it in the infancy? Is this something real? Are we gonna expect to see tangible results? That would have always been on my mind. And even if I sat in that meeting, if I write something four or five months down the road, I'm, I already know information in that meeting that technically maybe I can't share. So I would have preferred not to just hear it off the record. And that was where I just came from with that. Okay. I mean, I look at it in another direction is that um, there are many times that people in the media are in discussions that are off the record Yeah, that they take in that information and they have to be able to work around that. Right. Um, so I think it's just part of, part of how things work. So um, when they said media leave, I took it as, you know, this is not something that, you know, this is more of an informal gathering. This isn't, uh, you know, necessarily uh, a public uh, type meeting. It's not a town hall. It's not something right. that, you know, we're going to be, you know, discussing points that need to be reported on or anything like that. It's more of just a candid discussion that the people that we're attending, we're going to have around cigars and uh, the challenges that the cigar industry faces and things of that nature. Fair enough. Um, fair enough, but I think, and this is where I'm not saying I'm special or I'm different or anything like that, mm -hmm. but I have a history of doing this. Okay. I went down this road with Giuliani in 2016 and 2017, and I was very opinionated that I felt the industry wasn't connected at all with Giuliani. Um, nor did I feel Giuliani was connected with this industry. And I wrote a, probably some very controversial pieces there. Right. Mm hmm I'm not going to lie to you. If, if, if this was an open meeting and there weren't rules, I probably would have maybe wrote it positively or negatively. I don't know how it would have been because I don't know what was said in that meeting. Right. I have some ideas now. Um, so I gotta be, I'm being very frank with that. So I'm kind of glad I left it. I'm kind of glad they said that. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, I hope, would it have been nice if we knew this ahead of time? I think the answer is yes. Sure. That, that's what my feeling. And that's my only thing. It would have been nice uh, rather than me kind of trying to make time to go to this, but, but again, there's no anger. I think this was, I think it was a good thing that the cigar industry did this. I, I don't think this was a bad thing by any means. Right. So that's just, that was just kind of my thoughts on that. Um, that, uh, you know, you may, you have some different thoughts, I think on that too. Yeah. I mean, like I said, it was, um, it was advertised as a meetup, which to me, yeah. I kind of went into it thinking that that's what it was. Um, I was in there uh, for a bit of a curiosity factor. Um, I was curious what it was going to be, what was going to be talked about, um, see who was there, um, kind of what the agenda was, uh, going to be. And, um, yeah, it was basically, um, I don't know the specific role of the mod who the moderator was. I, I think he's definitely part of the, uh, the campaign um, of some okay. sort, mm -hmm. um, of the Republican party. And, um, he's a cigar smoker. And I think he was bridge, kind of do, bridging a bit of a gap between the cigar industry and, uh, you know, somebody that has the president's ear, which is his son. Um, and it was just a chance for some of the cigar industry to have an audience with uh, Donald Trump Jr. Um, it really wasn't uh, uh, kind of an open forum. It wasn't a Q&A session or anything like that. Um, it was really a chance for some of the... Um, cigar manufacturers, brand owners to um, have a few minutes to talk about, you know, their challenges, what they're experiencing uh, in regards to FDA uh, around COVID, all those types of things. Um, so there was definitely a, a flow to how the event went. It was only an hour and a half. Um, and, um, you know, I think it was managed well and, you know, how, you know, the speakers only had so much time and then you moved on to the next people. It wasn't just kind of a free flow. Um, so I was, there, you know, I was there for a curiosity factor. I wanted to kind of just see what was happening. And, um, you know, it's, you know, Donald Trump Jr. is not, uh, a part of, you know, the, the cabinet or anything like that. So he's really just somebody that is close to the president and can maybe throw something in his ear. Um, but, um, 
you know, Donald Trump Jr. asked some questions and he was listening to what was being said and things like that. So he seemed engaged. So, um, you know, I would, to me, I think overall it was a, it was a positive, a uh, positive thing. And that's what I want to be very clear. I do not think this was a negative thing. And, and uh, hopefully the people I've talked to last night feel like my, experience. everyone disagreed that I left, like I said, but I think I had certain reasons why I had to leave mm -hmm. um, under that. Um, but here's what I'll say. I did not go in this meeting expecting this to be a press conference for me to ask Trump Jr. questions. That was right. never an expectation. I knew that this wasn't the forum to do that. Mm -hmm. what, were they in, I'll ask a few questions here along the way. And if you can't answer them, that's fine. But were they engaging with consumers or were they just brand people or industry people? Yeah, the only people that, were, that spoke were um, brand related. Okay. Okay. And, and Donald Trump Jr. was smoking, I heard. Yes, he was smoking. Do we know what he was smoking? Uh, it was very hard to tell. Um, I was looking to trying to figure that out. Uh, okay. But the way he was holding the cigar, it was um, he had his kind of finger, finger, his forefinger wrapped over the cigar right around where the band was. So it was kind of hard to hard to see what it was. It was a bit of a reddish band. Um, you know, I had a feeling I knew what it was going to be, but I never got to be able to confirm that. So okay. I can't okay. say. That's okay. That's okay. And um, and in general, what are the people did? Was there any like you don't have to say this, but were was there anything earth shattering that came out of that that maybe and you could just say yes or no, it's fine. Is there anything that was surprising? Hey, this was went better than I thought just based on that. I don't think so. Um, you know, the people that got to speak, um, I've heard them speak on the topics before, and um, you know, they have definitely um, enthusiasm about it, and they were able to convey that in in there uh there are a lot of time and um so i don't think it was anything that was surprising or shocking or anything like that about it it was just um everybody you know had a had some time to talk they um made their points um it wasn't rambling so it was i thought it was good okay and how many people were in there about total uh at one point i thought there was a hundred like about 198 participants in there that, that's so, a pretty good that's a pretty good zoom meeting so yeah yeah i, I, I would understand. say there's probably that i could that i visually saw i would say there's probably there was probably like um half about a dozen to 18 brand owners manufacturers of that of that nature so okay all right, so that's, I mean, like I said, it sounds like a positive meeting. Um, there, was, there, was a, there was some retailers in there as well. Okay. Yeah, I saw, I did see a couple of the retailers in there as well. So, uh, you know, were there consumers in there? Mm hmm Okay, so there were consumers in there. A lot of consumers in there. But everyone yeah. was muted from what I understand. They, they personally yeah. unmuted you. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's what I. It'd be a it'd be a disaster if you have 190 people that all try yeah. to talk at the same time. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and like I said, I don't think this was gonna be a point where I was gonna say, "Hey, wh where are we going with this uh, bill?" And which you, yeah, which you, know, which you can't even say from what I understand either, because again, there's quid pro quo in there and things like that. You can't with a campaign. It's very and these are the things I learned yesterday too. So I kind of totally understand that. So like I said, that's my position on it. Um, and I just want to make it clear. I I want to say again, this was a positive thing for the industry. Good. Rather than not have it, this is certainly something that's positive. I hope they do more of these. I hope they do it with the Biden campaign. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, needless to say, and I knew the second I did this, it was going to be a problem. <laughs> it, it, you, you just can't mention the word, unfortunately, Trump without just becoming a polarizing political debate here. Right. And you made a point, and I want to hit some of these points here. There was like outrage towards this event, right? Yes. Which, first of all, I'm not outraged that, again, media was asked to leave. I, I was disappointed. That's all I'm saying. It's not mm -hmm. any. But there was outrage on this event. What, what was some of the outrage that you thought was, was spewing out over this event? Um, just because it was related with uh, the Trump campaign. Yeah. Um, you know, there was, in the, in the post that you made, there were some political comments that were made that were just very over the top. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, people that weren't maybe weren't even aware that the event was happening, uh, didn't attend the event, anything like that. Um, you know, just once they see a name, uh, they see a political party, um, they're ready to fire. So, uh, it's unfortunate that it, you know, that's kind of where we're at, where some people just choose to, um, blindly, uh, spew, uh, hatred, I guess would be the right way to say it. Yeah. 
Um, Jeff made a comment, and, and, it's, and I want to say it's accurate, the comment. He, he never asked anyone in the media to start promoting this. So I want to be very clear on that, that he respected, I think, the media on this one. And um, I didn't choose to promote it because it was – I did know that there was something involved with the campaign here. And I felt that peop, it's not my job to promote a campaign here. The only thing I would say is, yeah, I, I'm talking about tonight because his cigars were involved with a major player and a major a presidential campaign, which we've never seen in the industry before. Mm. But I felt I didn't want – I want our audience to have their own political – that's their own decision on, on how they want to vote. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's, that's just with that. But, but you made the comment, you're right. There were people that were making comments last night on my thread that were, they just, they didn't know what was happening. Um, look, I do things I didn't understand about this meeting. I'm telling right. you until after I made my comment, I'm kind of glad I made the comments because I learned a lot about this. Right. But they were just going off on like secondhand information, making assumptions. Um, and, you know, I know that Trump has his issues with the media, and I don't lump this in with that at all, is what I'm saying. Um, mm -hmm. This is a very there's, – there's legal reasons why certain things – and maybe why they wanted media people out of that. And I, I get it. It was more of a private event with an open call, I think, is the best way to put it. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and then you made the other point of uh, the political bias. I mean, I don't understand – on my, what the purpose of ranting on that is to begin with on social media. Uh, you're just not going to do that right now. Here. But there were a lot of people who, who agreed with me and there were a lot of people who disagreed with me for being mm -hmm. in them. And that was really, like I said, that was the essence of what I had to say about that particular meeting on that. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean, we went, we went back and forth in the post or in private messages and things like that around like what the promotion was and things like that. And um, I just wasn't privy to any information about any promotion that was, um, asked for or anything like that. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll preface this a little bit. I'm not, I, I didn't vote for Donald Trump for president. Um, I'm not necessarily a, a Trump supporter. Um, I'm just trying to go into things with an open mind. And that, I just wanted it. to, I just wanted to see what the event was. And that, that was what I, I went into it to do. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's very hard to be able to, um, kind of relate any, any kind of politics to uh, any kind of like, you know, conversations and things like that without some people going drastically one way or the other, instead of just being able to listen for a little bit, get a feel for what's going on, have a discussion about it, yeah. whatever the, you know, whatever the case may be. So. Well, and there, so that's good, but there were no like anti-Trump people that got into that. There was no anti Trump in that meeting, right? It was more just again. Um, I mean, when I was looking through the participants list, um, you know, there was a, a one one user in there named uh, BLM that just had a, a black logo on it. So I don't know what that was about, but I mean, with having everybody muted and they were, you know, the moderator was able to open up the microphone for whoever they were going to plan to speak to. You you couldn't really tell if anybody was going to do anything. I didn't see anybody like on video um, holding up signs or anything like that. Um, That's good. That was good. But too. I mean, it, you know, they, they, you had to register for the event. They sent an email to you if, um, you know, if they were allowing you to join that had the link to the thing, anybody could have gotten that link and emailed it to whoever they wanted. Those people could have tried to get in as well. So, I mean, it could have been, you know, if they, if they didn't moderate it correctly, yes, it could have been a, a bad thing. If, you know, the, it had been shared out with people that had a, you know, a, a different agenda for what they wanted to do in there. But, um, you know, it was, the event was held for what it was. It was managed correctly for that. And um, yeah, it, 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 they, they were able to, to guide it how they wanted to guide it. So do you think that maybe that it was, a, this is where I kind of go back. Maybe it was a flawed strategy by the cigar industry in that, that this is an industry so used to having open virtual meetings, mm -hmm. right? That maybe there should have been some expectations up front before people registered for this to say, Hey, look, you know, this isn't the name. This isn't your normal meeting. That's right. the part I think that was a little, because I think in this industry, the people who, did, you know, I heard people saying stuff today, like, oh, he didn't take any questions from, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that's something that I think the problem is our, our cigar industry were spoiled because we get access to people so easy sometimes in these things that here they didn't quite have the same access here. I could see that, but I also look at it a different, the other way as well is um, if you're not told that you're going to be able to ask questions, don't assume that you can ask questions, yeah. right? Like if you're not, 
if you haven't been given the green light that this is how what your access is going to be, don't assume that that's what your access is going to be. You you know you kind of take the information that you have, set your expectations, and then as you get to see how it unfolds, you get an idea of what you what's going to be allowed, what's not allowed, and then kind of go from there. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of like what my feeling is too on that. Um, I, I I'm in agreement on that. Um, you know, the other thing is, I don't, I want to just say, I don't judge anyone who is cigar media who stayed in that meeting. So that it was, I said, this was a personal choice I made. That was simply, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to ask, oh, how could you have been in that meeting and, and blah, blah. No, I, 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 I support anyone who felt that that was the right choice to do. Apparently, you know, from cigar industry people, they, 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 the cigar industry people probably could have knocked us out earlier from what I understand too. So if we weren't welcome, and again, these are things I learned afterwards right now, but I just said, this was my own comfort level as far as this goes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, I mean, your, in your opinion is your opinion and you're, you have the right and you can, you could stay or you could leave whatever you want to do. It's right. completely up to what you wanted to do. Yeah. You weren't, you weren't hurting anyone one way or the other. No, believe me, I, they, no one was missing me and no <laughs> one was, and the fact if I stayed, I couldn't write anything. Um, so, and I wouldn't have done that, but so, I mean, and I don't see people, the good news, I haven't really seen anyone, um, violate the trust of that. I saw, you know, a couple of you put the pictures up that they were on the uh, zoom screen with, with Trump. Yeah. I think every, I don't think there's any problem with that. I mean, it's, no, I mean, it was a publicized event that he yeah, was going to be yeah, in there. That's yeah. what the discussion was going to be. I think if some, you know, at, at rallies, people take pictures of themselves because they're this, they want to promote that they're, um, their political stance and things like that. And if they wanted to, you know, if they wanted to put their face against the screen and take a selfie with Donald Trump Jr. on the screen, have at it, like yeah. whatever you want to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, like I said, I even go back to Jeff who, you know, he's had, he's a very pro Trump guy. He makes no mm -hmm. bones about that. But you know, when he met with Joe Biden, um, he made the most of that meeting with a vice president of the United States. Obviously the meeting maybe didn't go to the way he wanted it to go. Right. But he respected the office. He respected the meeting. Meeting, and uh, when he had his kids, I remember he had his kids taking pictures of the vice. That's a big deal. I mean, that's uh, you know, that's this thing you got to let the politics go at that point and, and take the moment of you know. And Jeff was saying he felt I missed a historical moment maybe tonight, and last night. And that's a fair comment. Um, sure. you know I mean? That's a fair criticism. Yeah. But uh, he was Jeff was everyone. Like I said was the people I talked to. A message me were very kind. They didn't like I, I, I really did try not to take a shot at anyone here because I don't think there's a finger pointing other than this is probably something new for the cigar industry. It's the first time anything like this has been done. Yeah, yeah and I, it, it couldn't hurt, right? It couldn't like, hurt. Yeah. So I don't, there's, there shouldn't, there should be nothing negative yeah. associated with it. Yeah. Like yeah. it was just a, a gathering, informal gathering. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, so. and I would hope if they got like Joe Biden's son to do the same thing. That I hope he absolutely the same respect that they gave uh, Donald Trump Jr. in that meeting. There you go. So that's how I feel on that. And, yep. and I'm sorry 100%. if that upsets people, but uh, <laughs> in this political landscape. But this is uh, this is I think you know we always talk about this whole notion how we're all the same in a cigar line, but we're not the same right. on Facebook. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So all right. Anything else on that? Um. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go based on something that was that happened in your in your post, and I've made some comments on. Is yeah, like, sure. <clears throat> you know, I probably am, have done this in, at, at times, but uh, I try to keep myself from doing that is to just kind of react based on other people's um, thoughts on something. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I just felt in that thread, it was unfair for some people to kind of jump on uh, kind of uh, attacking the event um, when, they didn't, that, when, they, that when they didn't attend. Yeah, um, that was wrong. Things like that. And uh, I made my point clear with um, the people I thought were um, doing something incorrectly. So, um, uh, you know, the way our the way our society is right now is just there's not really there's, that that shouldn't be happening. Like we're at a point where we should be able to have, uh, you know, conversations uh, as adults, um, hear each other, disagreements, all those things yeah. um, that we don't need to like conjure up you know things that you know we have and you know don't it's it's sounds dumb saying this as a cigar reviewer because you think other cigar reviewers would have a, a, a similar thought process but don't let your biases uh affect your judgment on things yeah. uh, you need to do a better job of that so yeah i mean i could tell you <laughs> i voted for giuliani for mayor, I voted for him in a presidential primary, and I went after him pretty hard. I think uh, mm -hmm. people 
Now nah, I'm not getting as much anger as I was, but there were people really angry at me about well, how dare mm-hmm. I write that, you know? Um, sure. Um, but I felt, you know, I wasn't attacking him personally. Right. I, uh, really, but that's what it was. You know, I, I agree with you on that. I don't think that that's the place to do that. Um, in general, I just don't, I mean, we know the people who are, or who, who, who are constantly posting the politics. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I just would love to see how many people have they've converted because I don't think they've converted one person. Right. Yeah, yeah. I think they may. I think what they do is they just polarize it the other way. Mm-hmm. It, it's like the two ends of the magnet repelling each other. Yeah. That's what I, I I see happening. Like there's two strong forces and they repel each other. Is what right. happens. So exactly. Yeah. So that's what I look at that. Okay. Um, just kind of one final. Th- unless there's anything else on this we want to hit. No, I'm good. Uh, okay. Um we kind of talked about this at the beginning of the show, um, you know, this baseball thing. And I know we're going to probably talk about this on a baseball show at some point. Mm-hmm. I mean, thoughts What I mean, the 60 game season, uh, you know, I just, I'm, just I'm, the stuff I've kind of been hearing today about some of the things that may happen, you know, the, I'll tell you the one thing I hate that they're doing. Mm-hmm. I hate this, this extra innings thing that they're doing. I hate it. With the, with the runner on second. Start? I, I hate it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's hitting at the purity of the game they're doing here. Right. I just, I'd rather them have a tie. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather them have the tie in that case. Yeah. I mean, if you're just – the only thing, reason I think that they would be doing it is trying to end the game quicker, right? Like they want to limit the exposure of the players by being out there lo- even longer. Like, yeah, if you just want to make it a tie, make it a tie. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, know. That, that's what I thought too. Um, I, I kind of was hoping for some expanded playoffs this year. I was really hoping this would have been the year to do it. That didn't right. work out. Um, I don't know how umps are going to argue. Um, that's uh, your manager's going to argue what umps is going to be. Uh, and from what I said, are, they, are the managers not allowed to go to the pitcher's mound? Uh, I haven't read that part. Okay. That was a part I wasn't sure about. Uh, yeah. I, I just think there's, there's so many little, like little rule changes that they have to implement that like people are going to forget them. Like, you know, for them to have like this long checklist of things they have to remember that they have to do differently than they've done for their entire lives playing this sport like it's going to be a very different thing for them uh you know about like not spitting and the pitchers can have a like a wet rag in their pocket they can't you know lick their fingers and all those things that are you know just second nature to people to do that it's just going to be very difficult to be able to like maintain all those uh new rules right no i know now the the three batter rule is going into effect no matter what right i that's another i just Rob Manfred, I hate that rule. I, mean, just another <laughs> thing. I just, this is not what baseball's about again. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, I'm okay. You know, I'm okay with the DH this year, but I, I understand that they're trying to shorten the game. It's going to be permanent. So, well, I mean, do they have to, it's got to be voted on by the union. Well, the right? union, the base, the players right. association want wants it. it. Right. But do the owners want it? Well, that's a different thing. But yeah. I think that they, I, you know, because I think they're implementing now, they're, it's, it's like an automatic into 21 kind of a thing. Yeah. So um, at that point, a year and a half worth of it, you're, it's going to be tough to pull it back out. Yeah. I mean, here's the other thing that to think about, and this is where I'm just worried about what I'm hearing. If they have to stop this season in a 60 game season, it's going to be catastrophic. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I think if they have to stop it, they're going to stop it before July 24th. I mean, that's just my feeling and cancel the season. I mean, I, I just, I think this would be, a, what, it would just be a disaster if they, if they cancel, if they have to stop play because it's a big outbreak or yeah, teams have to I'm, forfeit or something like that. Yeah. And I think that's what, that's what the struggle is now is that you're seeing, you know, seeing all these reports of, you know, how many people are, have been infected from each team and things like that. It's just like, and with the increase in infections that are just happening from the general public is like there's a chance there's got to be a chance that this just doesn't happen because you know players start getting sick uh or you know the number that of of players that have already been sick is just you know it's tough to to try to push through this yeah unless you're just having like half a team of major leaguers half a team of minor leaguers kind of trying to put somebody on the field i agree one i mean the minor leaguers are going to do it regardless because this is their that would be their shot to get some exposure so yeah. I think the minor leagues are, leagues are in a tough spot. You know, they have to choose career over health kind of a thing. 
what is the status of the minor leagues this year? I've heard some talk it's canceled completely. You, yeah, minor leagues is, totally is canceled. canceled as far as I know. Um, and each team can choose to pay their players for whatever amount of time. And I've seen, you know, a lot of have chosen to pay through, you know, the end of the regular season. And uh, some had been, you know, kind of pushing like each month forward. They were, you know, increasing in another month, things like that. So um, as far as I know, there's, there will be no minor league baseball. So if there's a possibility they have to call a guy up from the minors, like not my, but let's say they want to dip into a roster of right. an affiliated team. I mean, can they still do that? And how would that work? Yeah. I mean, I would think that, you know, if you have a set roster at the beginning of the season and you guys, you got to keep people that start getting hurt or sick, you're going to have to be able to bring up guys. So, uh, you know, those guys have to be, you know, either at a, a training facility somewhere kind of staying in shape or on their own or whatever it is. But I'm sure they're still protected. Like, so if the uh, A's have to go to their minor league team, their triple A team, not anyone could just grab one of those guys. The A's would have. Yeah, it's, I think they still own their they they still own their uh, lower organizations. Okay. Okay. And here's my last scenario that I have that's an interesting thing. Maybe we'll have a 400 hitter this year. I don't that's think it's going I think I don't think it's. I obviously it's not going to be a true 400 hitter. Right. But I think it will be interesting if we do have someone that could actually say they batted 400 this year. What's the what's the what's the number of at bat eligibility for the batting title? That I'm not sure of. They're gonna have to mm, set. That, that would be that would be the question. Right. Well, they're gonna have to have a like th- this year to have to prorate it. I would guess. I have to. We, I would assume they prorate it based on a 60 game season. Yeah, I mean, but those are the only things. The the ratio categories are the only things that any kind of records would be broken. There's yeah. no, you're not on a quanti- quantitative uh, category. There's no, no chance. No, no so. none of that. And, and like I said, I think of all the ratio categories, the one that would stand out would be the, the batting average. Right. Yeah. I think that's, I mean, I don't think people are going to care much about a whip or an ER, maybe a little of an ER, but I don't, I can't think of many others that would really carry the same weight on that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's going to be interesting. And, the playoffs is there's no plans for the fans to be at the playoffs. Is that one been decided? Uh, I was seeing some things today where they were talking that they were hoping at some point during the season that they would at, at least be able to have limited fan okay. attendance yep. at the games. Yeah. So I don't know what that looks like. Could you imagine if they had done the Arizona, Texas, Florida plan? We would have no baseball this year. Oh yeah. Thank goodness they didn't do it. Thank goodness. I mean, we were all intrigued with some of the things happened, but thank goodness they didn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll have some baseball. Um, I don't know when we're going to have hockey, by the way. So, but we may have hockey in like August. <laughs> yeah. I know you don't care about that, but that's the, uh, I, look, I, I that's all. you know, I don't, I don't think there's going to be football this year. So, um, you know, I'm a, I'll, I'll look on the, on the I, pessimistic side of things for that. But I asked my son who's supposed to work app state radio crew this year. Um, not necessarily broadcast, but he's really part of the production, and he doesn't think it's happening. Is what he told me. I mean, that's everything he's hearing is uh, he's, mm-hmm. he says he doesn't think it happens this year. That, that, right. So we'll see. And he's kind of really bummed on that. So because uh, this is his junior year, so we'll see. Mm-hmm. I, I think I think like the NFL, the same thing. Imagine if they have to stop the NFL. The NFL, you if you had to stop the NFL season, that would be the worst thing to happen. With NFL, think about how you have to get these guys into shape and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, like, you got to think with, um, you know, baseball's one. Baseball, um, maybe soccer would be like the ones that have the be- the best distance between players, right? Yeah. In football, tons of contact. Basketball, there's a lot of contact. Um, maybe not. I mean, some in hockey, but not a ton. So yeah, definitely, f- definitely, football is the big one where like you have a lot of contact going on. So. It's it's tough to see that you know people wouldn't be kind of passing that around. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so Bears saying it's five hundred two at bats, right? So it would be yeah. about three A's. So I guess we could do the math on that, and that's what you need for your at bats. Yeah, so you'd be looking at 200, 200, 220 something at bats, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> um, I like I said that that's the one thing I, I I'll admit I'll be a little intrigued by that. Um, I came up with one hundred eighty eight. Yeah, that, that. So okay. let's figure around the 200. It's not unusual. Yeah. All right. Um, so we shall see uh, what's going to happen with baseball. Yeah. Uh, stay tuned on that. We're all uh, 
Uh, and by the way, Alan Rubin uh, had the the comment of the night. He goes, Marlins games already have social distancing as there is no one in the stands. There you go. There you go, Alan. <laughs> that, that, is, that is the comment of the night here. Uh, <laughs> very, very true. All right. Uh, anything else, Aaron? I think we're good. All right. A uh, couple of programming notes. Um, on Monday, we will be doing another primetime jukebox. Actually, we're doing three this month. Uh, Seth is going to come back on that with Dave and I. We're doing album archaeology on Led Zeppelin II, who was the winner of the Battle of the Bands contest. Mm-hmm. Uh, the iTunes gift card will be drawn on Friday morning for the winner. I had to compile all the data today, which took a little longer. Um, and then next week, uh, for primetime episode 145, um, we have another pretty big guest coming back, Raphael Nodal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm pretty excited to have him back. Um, yep. We're actually going to move one of the contests that we do, uh, the Altidus contest we do on Tuesday to Thursday. Uh, so there'll be a Romeo who yet uh, giveaway on that one. We'll yes. move that since Raphael's on. And yep. he, he kind of sponsors this, makes some sense. So sure. we'll have that contest as well. So you'll have to be tuned in live to win. All right. Uh, again, we want to thank Ernesto Perez Cuyo uh, for being our guest. Aaron, thank you very much. And Absolutely. most of all, thank you to the audience there. Uh, who hung in there as always with us. And that's going to wrap up primetime episode 144 into the annals of history. And this is Thursday, June 25th. And we're still June 25th on the East coast. We'll see everybody next week. Have a great night, everybody. See you guys.